Welcome everybody. Good morning, good evening, in whichever continents you are. Thank you for joining uh, today for our uh, digital robotic mini symposium. Uh, on behalf of SCRN, which is Society for Cardiac Robotic Navigation, I welcome everybody. Also, first like to thank everyone uh, who has been a hero during this pandemic. I'm sure you know some of you have treated COVID patients. So again, thanks for your services. Um, on behalf of SCRN, uh, as I said, you know, I welcome everybody for this symposium. This was supposed to be a live symposium during HRS, but because of the pandemic, we all have to transition to a, a, a webinar session. Uh, my name is Gurjeet Singh. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, and I'm honored to host this webinar. And we have an excellent faculty uh, presenting various topics using robotics and uh, advanced mapping systems. Uh, so I'm going to, before we move forward, I'm going to have a poll so that we can know what the participants are where from and uh, what their backgrounds are. So I'm going to open the poll. And finish the poll and here are the results. So obviously we have most physicians, few physician assistants, yeah. practitioner, we have few fellows, engineers, industry professionals and others. All right. Second question is where everybody is logging from. And here are the results. So North America, 57%. Our European colleagues are there. A few people from Asia and Africa. All right. And the last question. Who is an active user for the robotic technology in the lab? So it looks like we have almost half the attendees who have some experience with the robotic systems and half not. So hopefully today's webinar and uh, people get to see something new and maybe we can change this percentage in the future webinars. Okay, so let me go to today's agenda. So I would like to uh, thanks our, thank our sponsors. So including Heart Rhythm Society, Strader Taxes and Acutus Medical for supporting our program today. And we did all the polls. So the agenda today is uh, we have an excellent uh, faculty members. So Dan Cooper will be talking about uh, robotics in, in the EP fellowship, followed by Dr. Bunch, who will uh, talk about uh, uh, radio frequency approaches, including lesion size, depth, and precision. Dr. Kazimian will be talking about floorless ablation in the robotic era, followed by a very interesting talk from Tamash about man beats robot or the robot beats man. Dr. Burkhardt will talk about summit PVCs and VTs and the use of shear taxes and magnetic navigation, followed by uh, Pete Wise from Banner University about advanced mapping system. And then we have, at the end, we have an interesting uh, mini talk regarding robotics and telemedicine during this COVID pandemic. So Dr. Crystal, uh, who's our president of our SCRN, and Dave Fischel will uh, join in at that point. A uh, few uh, keeping house, house points, as I said, you know, people can ask questions in the Q&A sessions or they can ask the chat. Every speaker will present for 15 minutes, followed by five minutes of Q&A. Uh, I will ask those questions on behalf of everybody else, and then we'll move to the next speaker. At the end, we will also have a Q&A sessions collectively. So a little bit about our society. So SCRN was formed by these three nice looking gentlemen across the Atlantic, Tamash in the middle, uh, Bruno, Tracton on the right-hand side, and Jörg Nolker. They formed the first SCRN society in Europe in the year 2015. And we uh, collect, uh, formed the Society of Robotic Navigation from the American continent, with Dr. Crystal being our uh, president. And in 2017, we, formed, we joined hands, and now we are a global society, both the American and the European. So again, on behalf of the society, I welcome everybody to today's webinar. So without further ado, I'll open the sessions, and we'll have uh, our first session, Dr. Dan Cooper talking about robotics and EP fellowship. All right, excellent. So uh, honored for the invitation to start off the program. Uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be discussing uh, robotics and, and training programs. And we'll start with the current state of, of training modalities. So. Uh, 
And as you all know, often uh, EP fellows kind of start uh, in a stage of, uh, of being an observer where they watch a lot and they build knowledge and they fill knowledge gaps, but uh, they can't stay in that stage very long. It's of limited benefit. Um, and everyone knows the mantra of see one, do one, teach one. And that works very well when you're learning how to do an ABG or uh, uh, do a paracentesis or, or a central line during medicine residency, but it doesn't really apply to uh, uh, procedural specialties like EP. And that's why we've adopted, uh, much like the surgeons, uh, a mentorship type model where we have an expert or a uh, number of experts that train an apprentice or a fellow. And that model has worked quite well in passing on our craft from generation to generation, uh, but there are some downsides. It can be very mentor dependent. Uh, and we all know that the ability to share expertise is somewhat variable when it, uh, when it comes to EPs. And so it becomes very important that our training programs have a lot of structure so that we know that we are successfully carrying uh, our novices towards uh, becoming independent operators. Because what we do is, is not easy. Uh, it can be quite intimidating at first. Uh, on your left, uh, while I've been blabbing, uh, I have a recorded uh, movie of one of our fellows several years back who was creating a left atrial geometry with a spiral mapping catheter. And it can be quite intimidating when a fellow early on is trying to make sense of what's going on here. You're trying to take this dark screen and you're starting to draw uh, geometry, which begins as kind of this amorphous blob of, of uh, unclear uh, uh, geo. Uh, and uh, as the training goes on, you turn that amorphous blob into uh, something that resembles the cardiac chamber you are in, like the left atrium here, while along the way trying to be safe and finding all the nooks and crannies that you need uh, uh, specific to the ablation that you're performing uh, and uh, hopefully not uh, doing something dangerous like going into the ventricle uh, with a circular catheter here. And hopefully you guys would have warned me if that happened while I was talking. And so to ensure that our fellows are getting to where they need to get, We've adopted this modular training approach because we know that our procedures have a number of steps and those steps are of um, uh, variable difficulty. And some of them are easy to master and some of them take uh, quite a while to master. And every trainee is different. And so we have to have kind of a, a, a formal way of measuring those steps and making sure that our fellows are not falling behind and they're progressing towards competency and achieving the milestones along the way. And so this is the model that, that we follow. And in addition to conventional training, uh, over the years, we've tried to incorporate um, robotic EP into our fellowship as well. So uh, we'll be talking about this system quite a, a bit today, but this is the stereotaxis system that utilizes magnetic navigation to drive this catheter that you're seeing here um, throughout the chamber of interest to get to the areas where we ablate arrhythmia mechanisms. And the nature of this catheter, which has the consistency of a spaghetti noodle, uh, allows it uh, to be uh, very safe and maneuverable. And there's a lot of attributes that uh, uh, makes it attractive in our world. It allows us to have a lot of precision within challenging anatomy. Uh, one of the talks today will be a VT summit talk by Dr. Burkhart, and, and that's one of the most challenging places to eliminate arrhythmia from, and he'll go into how he manages to do that. This particular technology has great stability on intracavitary structures like the moderator band or papillary muscles, structures that can be a challenge, especially for trainees early on. Uh, to achieve stability, um, to eliminate arrhythmia. Importantly, uh, in my mind, this technology makes radiofrequency ablation as safe as you can make it. Um, and it minimizes catheter ectopy and, and bumplation, which is important in uh, a number of the arrhythmias that we attack. It democratizes efficacy across skill and experience levels, so it allows 
uh, a relative novice to uh, operate safely in a chamber of interest uh, quite quickly with a, a, a much shorter learning curve. And in my mind, it's really the perfect teaching environment, which will be my focus. So magnetic navigation uh, is, uh, is perfect uh, for the training. Now, there's really less to think about. You only have the mouse in front of you. Uh, it's not as intimidating. You know, you saw on that first slide uh, us going from that two-dimensional screen to the fellow generating this 3D geometry. Uh, and that progression uh, is very important uh, uh, as the fellow learns to, to go from 2D to 3D. And they do it in an environment that is less stressful uh, and has improved safety because of the nature of this catheter. And importantly, it's okay to fail. Uh, and when you fail with a manual catheter, often it results in you losing the catheter. And when you're in the uh, magnetic environment, um, because of the safety factor of the catheter and catheter manipulation, um, you can build in a little bit of failure without sacrificing uh, much time or safety uh, uh, to the patient. It's also uh, an environment that allows us to do multiple things at once. So if you look here, here's a picture of Pete Weiss uh, uh, dutifully training uh, someone uh, in the arts of robotic navigation. And in front of them are everything that you need. You can manipulate the catheter with the mouse. You can stimulate uh, uh, the, the heart with the micro pace. Um, and you can assess EGMs. You don't have to leave the patient's uh, side uh, to go look at EGMs in this environment. And so it makes it very easy to teach and go from one modality to another uh, uh, seamlessly. Uh, also importantly, the available simulators for robotic navigation closely mimic this real world experience. Because again, it's just using a mouse or a joystick. Now, simulation is, is very important. We've learned a lot of lessons from the aviation industry that has incorporated simulation into their training uh, from the very beginning, dating back to World War I. Uh, and they use simulation to make sure that their trainees are uh, safe for the air and they use it to assess competency, not only at the beginning of training, uh, but throughout training and throughout someone's career as new technology comes out. And it's based on a number of principles that procedural risk is reduced with increasing operator experience, okay? And simulator-based training can really accelerate uh, these learning curves without adding patient risk. You're doing things uh, that uh, uh, mimic very closely what you would do in a human, uh, but without the human there, without the angst and, and, and risk of, of doing it uh, uh, in the middle of a uh, patient case. We've been slow to uh, evolve beyond the apprenticeship model, and it's uh, something that I think uh, will become more and more important as, uh, as time goes on with all of this emphasis on quality improvement and big data-driven hospital practices where everyone is looking at our data and we need to own our data and use that data to improve uh, our practices that is almost definitely going to impact training. Um, whether we like it or not, training slows us down to some extent, and the argument can be made that at least early on in a trainee's learning curve, there is some difference in risk um, that we can't completely eliminate. And as data comes out and we are held to account for that uh, uh, procedural data, whether it's procedural time or procedural safety, um, guidelines may change in terms of how the trainee is incorporated into the environment without any impact on those hard numbers. Um, and so we have to be prepared to evolve as that changes. Now, simulators have been around for a while, and they really excel in procedure-based specialties like interventional cardiology or in our world in EP. Here are a few examples. Uh, um, one looking at catheterization, one looking at TEE. This is an EP simulator here. Um, and there's a number of EP-specific simulators that uh, can be utilized in a fellowship program. Groin access, pericardiosynthesis, echo, transeptal, ablation biophysics, wet lab, CRT, leadless pacemakers, 
all of these uh, have improved dramatically over the years and can give a trainee a good sense of what it means to do these things inside a human before they're required to do it. Uh, and importantly, within the uh, magnetic navigation robotic environment, they also have simulators, uh, either on a laptop or inside a phantom uh, in the lab that allows you to traverse all four chambers and investigate uh, uh, arrhythmia specific anatomy such as that uh, uh, in AFib and VT and do so again in a very controlled safe environment. Now there's not a lot of data uh, unfortunately on simulation uh, in our world uh, but this is one of the few papers that looked at uh, a simulator uh, for catheter placement of a coronary uh, sinus catheter and uh, his catheter. And it measured trainees uh, early in their training um, uh, in terms of the level of help uh, and instruction that they needed to place a catheter. And then they gave them simulator training and re-measured. And when it came to positioning the CS and the HIS, the simulation seemed to significantly change the uh, uh, amount of instruction and the fluoroscopy time for the better uh, in these situations. Here is a study that looked at TEE and cardiovascular fellowship, and they looked at a set of fellows that went through training without simulation and compared it to two groups that had simulator training, one that was introduced early to the simulator and another that was uh, introduced uh, later, uh, the second month of training. And what they found is that the TEE simulation improved proficiency uh, of the procedure. They were able to achieve the uh, views much quicker. Uh, their learning curve was much shorter. Their level of comfort with obtaining the views uh, was greater and they needed less repeated instructions to achieve um, the desired views. And so what we've done uh, uh, over the last couple of years is that we've taken our informal uh, exposure to robotics and tried to give it some structure uh, by formulating a robotic ablation fellows education program um, in collaboration with Stereotactus. And our goals for this program were to expose uh, our trainees to advanced robotic technology. Uh, we wanted to utilize uh, leverage robotics uh, so that they can have early and safe hands-on participation in procedures again not losing the catheter because of the safety of, of the uh, uh, catheter. Um, we wanted them to have an enhanced appreciation of arrhythmia-specific anatomy and uh, uh, using this catheter and being able to fail and, and continuing to generate that, uh, that uh, geometry uh, does just that for them. We also wanted our fellows to be positioned, well positioned, so that they could be future leaders in the world of robotic EP. Now, it's always important to get our guys jobs, and uh, this is one more thing that can be a feather in the cap of our trainees. Here is a spattering of the robotic systems uh, that are in place uh, throughout uh, the United States. And, um, uh, uh, you know, whenever our trainees graduate, uh, we want them to be fully competent in robotic ablation so that they could go to a place that either has an underutilized system or utilizes the system greatly and either fit right in or be the leader of the program. And another thing to talk about on the interview trail never hurts. So we gave it some structure. These are the program requirements uh, for our robotics program. We introduced them to the magnetic environment uh, with didactics that takes about two hours um, uh, through online training. We put them through simulator training for about six hours, which is laptop based, and they also can use the Phantom uh, in the lab. Uh, they want to achieve six hours of simulator training. And then over the course of their fellowship, uh, while not sacrificing their experience with manual ablation, we want them to get at least 25 procedures proctored by an experienced user of the robotic system. Ideally, we want to mix in a number of different arrhythmia mechanisms, and we give them formal feedback along the way at 10, 20, and the 25th case. We also try to enhance the program along the way with some hands-on hard anatomy sessions, 
Uh, in St. Louis, they have some opportunity to participate in uh, animal procedures when, when able. Um, we want them to interact with other uh, robotics fellows across the nation or world. Um, and we want them to participate in our uh, uh, society meetings. Here is an example of one of our efforts in St. Louis where we put on uh, uh, an arrhythmia specific anatomy session where we spent an hour and a half going over the anatomy of flutter and AFib and PVCs and VT um, and went straight from the anatomy session where they were hands on and looking directly at it in a three dimensional sense and then apply, uh, applying it in simulators. Uh, and then the robotic system uh, was utilized as well over the course of a long Saturday morning. We also uh, mirrored this uh, in, uh, every uh, year in April, we do a anatomy and simulator uh, experience for incoming EP fellows that we do in Austin uh, every April. Uh, when there's not a pandemic, hopefully uh, we'll do it again next year. So in summary, simulator-based training really has great value uh, in this uh, uh, training environment that I hope continues to evolve as it's been somewhat stagnant uh, uh, over my time. The robotic EP environment really offers further opportunity to accelerate learning curves uh, while not sacrificing safety or efficacy. And integrating robotics training into a program uh, as I said, expands the trainee skill set uh, and without really sacrificing manual skills if you do it well. And I have no doubt that the future of EP will include robotics, um, and therefore it's very important that the education of our trainees should reflect that reality so that they can adapt, uh, and not only adapt, but thrive and, and lead in this space. That's all I have, thank you. And I'll take any comments or questions. Thank you, Dan, really appreciate it. It was an excellent talk. And I agree with you, you know, you put it right. This is a perfect teaching environment for the fellows. I mean, we have two fellows and uh, they have been exposed to robotics from day one and it's just amazing experience. You know, you can sit with them, spend time in teaching electrograms, you know, look at maps, you don't have to go in and out. So clearly, uh, hopefully robotics should stay with the EP fellows. Um, we have one question. Um, the question is, I'm sure everybody can see it, I hope. Uh, it appears that currently the robotic EP training is typically a part of a regular EP fellowship program in the US and elsewhere. What's the strategy to expand the EPs worldwide with robotic EP? Somebody is interested in robotic EP. Yeah. It's and, a that's a good question. I, you know, I, I think, you know, right now, um, uh, because the uh, predominant way of performing ablation is manually, um, you know, the robotics piece has to be just a, a, a slice and, and can't be the focus. But as it grows uh, in popularity and as we innovate and as it becomes a more and more important part of our world, I could certainly imagine a scenario where, um, you know, it'll become a bigger part of the conventional fellowship and we could even uh, generate, you know, one year fellowships focused entirely on robotics, uh, um, you know, similar to what uh, some of the surgical subspecialties have done. Perfect. And also, uh, I know Dan Fischel uh, from Share Taxes, you know, they are offering a lot of simulator training online. So hopefully, uh, you know, that can uh, enhance the experience online and maybe obviously, you know, you have to have a system to, to obviously do the robotics. So hopefully these webinars, these sessions, you know, and uh, HRS participation, hopefully it induces more interest in, in using the system. Okay, all right. I see, a, I see a question about how many fellows have we uh, put through this um, process and we started it in 2017, I think. So, and we have um, uh, two fellows a year. So we've, we've probably put, uh, six total fellows through it, but we have uh, four current fellows and um, uh, three on the way that uh, will be getting exposure here soon. Yeah, and then hopefully moving forward, you know, once we have enough, uh, you know, impetus, hopefully they, it can become an ACGME accredited fellowship. You know, that's probably will be the, the way to go at the end. Okay, any more questions? 
somebody is asking what training do the new users get? Um, I believe that's, you know, for the ET physician. So I, training probably is, you know, if, if you are in a place where you have somebody already using it, you know, that's probably the one way to training. I know uh, Sarah Taxes offers some simulation training at their center. Um, and there we are, uh, I know we are running some proctorship programs where you can get connected to EP physicians who are well versed with robotics, either online through phone or uh, they can actually visit your center and do first few cases with you. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Pedram is asking, do we, we need to develop competency milestones for RMN? Um, I'm open to the question to all the panelists. I believe, yes, I mean, we should have a certain number of cases, uh, certain type of cases to, to have a milestone. Um, I'd open to other, other panelists as well. Could I ask a question briefly, kind of along the lines of those? Please. So, so, so uh, progress happens oftentimes through this interplay between the physicians and the users and kind of um, an industry understanding each other, seeing where there's needs. And so really the fellowship program and the formalizing of an actual structure to it was driven largely by Dr. Cooper, kind of uh, saying that this was a useful thing for his fellows and then, and then us and, uh, and Dr. Cooper working together to structure something that has actually gone out now to uh, 20 some hospitals uh, globally that, that have implemented uh, robotic EP fellowships. And um, I see kind of several questions here about new users, not fellows, but, but uh, attending physicians and kind of a formal training process. Do you think that that would be something useful to establish a formal training process? Or do you think that there's too much variability between individual physicians? And so unlike fellows, which are used to kind of a more structured learning process, it, it wouldn't work well with attending fellows. We'd obviously be delighted to try to work on, on one, but we haven't sensed that yet um, a need. And now as I'm observing these questions, it's, it's prompting me to think a little bit more. I agree with you, yes. I mean, that's what I think the proctorship programs should help, you know, and people who are starting to use the system or the newer or haven't used too much. I think there's where the industry and the physicians can connect together. So again. I do think that uh, establishing even some type of certificate program makes perfect sense that would be applicable both to fellows and to uh, potential new users uh, who are more experienced. This is a, a, a very interesting place for telemedicine and, uh, and remote learning as well, right? So, you know, there's certainly a potential to have, you know, visiting uh, where folks would come out and, and see experienced users uh, work and also some uh, of the users and trainers could, could visit some new centers. Uh, at the same time, uh, working remotely to uh, cooperate uh, potentially or to mentor uh, from afar would make sense. But I do think that the model Dan has established for the fellows uh, it certainly could work for more experienced operators as well. Uh, certainly some of those milestones that, that he's created. And, and Dan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are, there are several other fellowship programs that are following your model already. Is that correct? How many, how many centers around the country are training fellows according to your model at this point? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's nice to have some uniformity as well. Yeah, I think, I think David mentioned maybe about 20 programs uh, uh, across, uh, is that the globe that have uh, yeah, adopted? about 25, I believe. About, we have now about 40 fellows uh, uh, across those hospitals and about 25 hospitals. Uh, may I comment uh, on the fellow versus new uh, user uh, training program? The, the issue here is uh, that, um, uh, at least in Europe, but I suppose it's the same in the States, um, most of the time uh, the fellow will not work permanently at the place where he's trained or she's trained. And, and that's why actually we are talking probably about the same thing. Uh, when a post fellow comes to our institute, um, uh, we consider it as, as a new user, but actually in that respect is a fellow. And until a, a large majority of the centers are equipped with, um, with the stereotaxi system, um, it will always be a little bit um, uh, imbalance. Um, uh, between fellow and and um, a new user training. On the other hand, if 80% of the centers are equipped with any kind of robotics, obviously robotics will be implemented on a much more structured way in the uh, EP fellow training. 
And I can fully understand our fellows if they want to go for the manual procedures, even if they hate it, but they know that they have to learn that because in the next place they will not have access to the stereotypes. Okay. All right, perfect. So let's move on to our next session. Uh, which will be by Dr. Jared Bunch, Beyond Force. Uh, he'll be talking about other approaches to augment lesion size, depth and precision in radio frequency technique. Dr. Bunch. Hey Joe, you may might have mentioned what you just wrote into the, uh, quickly what you mentioned, what you just wrote into the chat. Yeah, so um, I was part of the COCATS committee as we considered fellowship training for EP and the complexity of EP and the need for a certain number of procedures. Um, and it became quite clear that there is a there is room, and also there's there's a concern of extending too far, and an interest perhaps to shorten training in general areas. But there's but there's also a need in EP to in, to consider additional training of such for things such as epicardial VT, uh, adult congenital um, uh, complex extraction, and I think. Uh, robotic technology would fit into this category. So written into the guidelines is to consider six months of additional training if you have specific interests in a certain area of EP, um, which may not, you may not receive the numbers in a standard training program. So these type of uh, educational pathways are already something that's being considered um, through the ACC and COCATS. Um, well, this is a great opportunity for me, and I really appreciate the uh, pleasure to see friends and also the opportunity to speak on uh, ablation. This is where I started my research in EP and talk beyond force what other approaches are available uh, to, to augment ablation success, lesion size, depth, and, provision, and precisions. And I think one of the things we consider for us, and this came out just this, this year, that. Uh, from Wendy and, and, and Will Sal, um, radio frequency catheter ablation, may the force be with you always. And how important is force? And I think it's one of our natural tendencies as people if, is if something doesn't work to push a little harder. And is that always the best strategy? <clears throat> we started looking at this early on when we could monitor force with Hansen's robotics. If some of you older people with gray hair remember that as well. Um, and also when the, the beginning of force sensing technology uh, became available, but using ice guidance to suggest if, if we had contact, if we had contact plus tinting, and also on the silhouette of the heart to say, are we pushing or just touching? And we've learned from tactile feedback that we've learned that the tactile feedback and force registered on a tip are often not congruent, but this was some of the early work in that. And as we were, we under, as we found is what makes sense that force from zero to 10 was minimally disruptive on ice and floral. When it was from 10 to 20, 25, it was consistent and stable. And then afterwards we would see actual tinting. And so we could see a direct correlation with visual feedback and force. And that force and what is critical in speaking of fellows, I talk to them a lot about this when they uh, see a force feedback, whichever catheter they're using, and they just push harder in regions in which the catheter may not be perpendicular, or it may be oblique. But our ability to translate force based on, cat, on tip orientation is, is significant and, and it's harder to create tinting um, and understand that with forces that are against the, the vector of the catheter and the, and the vector of the drive shaft. So as we speak and consider lesion creation, this was a porcine model we created with a force under 10, a force of 10 to 20, and a force greater, 10, uh, greater than 20, looking on top of endocardial lesion creation, where you can see it's almost hard to see, where it's clearly visual, and here, with a, with a crater formation, and then epicardial looking for transmural. And I think this up here is critical, and we wrote an editorial about this. One of the important aspects of force is force ultimately will overcome the porous flow of a catheter. 
And so you can regionally shunt flow from one area of the catheter to the other. And so this is e even more relevant today, and that's found foundational upon the Bernoulli principle that excessive force can render your irrigated catheter non-irrigated if it overcomes the basic fluid dynamics of the catheter. So what we found was uh, too much, too little force. It was often uh, inconsistent with the transmural lesion. The sweet spot from 10 to 20 was often consistent with a transmural lesion. But also when we started to perform tenty or get tenting in excessive force, which is somewhat of our natural instinct, we also lost lesion efficacy. And so force is, is essential, but not too little or not too much. And the same principle applies um, both for the, the area of our lesions and the volume when the catheter angle is distorted um, and begins to be, instead of straight against the tissue, becomes more oblique. We start that force uh, relationship begins to be altered. And excessive force when the catheter isn't perpendicular is, is inefficient, even when you're really pushing hard. So what do we know about catheter ablation? This is the Cabana trial, which we all know well in this, this audience. And we know that catheter ablation is relatively effective at about 70% at one year, but at, 40, at four years, it's still suboptimal. And one in five, one, or 50% of people will, will uh, have a recurrence. And this is consistent in, ca in Cabana across different catheter designs different center sizes. So there's still a long ways to go to improve our outcomes with catheter ablation, which gives an opportunity for innovation. So what we need is when we create our three-dimensional maps and we make lesion markers, we need this to correlate that well with what we're doing. And this is amazing work from Dr. Ravi Ranjan, if you haven't met him. And this is MRI, not showing fibrosis per se, but dense scar. So what we really need is this image to correlate extensively with the scar creation. And on this image, even though there was extensive ablation along the right-sided veins, there was lack of uh, scar formation on those veins for various reasons. But we need a congruent map. And one of the interesting things that we're studying right now in Dr. Ron John's lab is this. This is a, an MRI immediately after the ablation, and this is with T-weighted imaging, and this is the long-term lesions. And here we can see massive edema uh, that is out of proportion to what the ultimate lesions are. So looking at this specifically, this is chronic lesions. This is the acute process on T2-weighted images. When we do T1-weighted images, we can highlight perhaps necrotic tissue. And again, you can see it here as well in another specimen. And we all see this as we're ablating. We are ablating around the pulmonary vein. And before we're even all the way around it, we see electrical isolation. And this reflects this massive edema front that is out of proportion to the actual lesions we're creating. So the target and the goal is to minimize acute edema and augment lesion size, essentially to take what we see real time and what we see at three months and have these register and be the same. And this is a little bit busy, but I think it's critical. And so what Dr. Ron John and the team here at University of Utah did was they looked at various factors that we can modify. Um, the time we perform ablation, the force we perform ablation, and a force time integral taking into account stability of the catheter, looking at 25 watts, 35 watts, 45 watts. And the thing I want to draw your attention to more than all these curves is the slope. And the slope is very abrupt from the origin to the nadir when we consider FTI and when we consider time and is somewhat flat um, for power. And the slope really early on from the origin to the nadir reflects the likelihood of, of the acute lesion registering uh, equally as, as a true positive with the chronic lesion. And our ability to, nav to, to achieve those with time and stability is more likely than that with power to cry across different power settings from 25 to 50 watts. And so, in this, in, in, 
when we consider the changes on MRI, there is a linear association with the changes on MRI in the edema and the lesion volume. So we can create a massive injury, which also has massive amounts of edema, and there is a correlation with, with what we're ultimately going to get. But what's interesting when we consider force alone, that with little force, uh, there's poor correlation with ultimately the volume uh, we, of injury we get on MRI. And then there's somewhat of a plateauing, reflecting the histology work before, that there's probably a sweet spot between the perfect contact, excessive contact. So the whole story from Dr. Zhao and Sauer was that the force and stability will be with you always because stability is integral in the catheter uh, of lesion formation in order to get minimize edema and also uh, um, have a corresponding reproducible lesion set on MRI of scar, again, not fibrosis, but actual scar compared to what your three-dimensional map shows. So this is uh, interesting data as well from Dewey, from Stanford, uh, but also a, a diverse group looking at the role of continuous ablation uh, and maturation lesions in a mirroring model and intermittent ablation strategies. So consider keeping ablation on for 60 seconds or a drag approach uh, or 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, 30 seconds on, or 15. So in all, they get 60 seconds of RF ablation, but is the paradigm continuous, long interruptions, or brief interruptions? And I think all of us fall somewhere in there. And this here shows, I need to move myself here, down, out here. <laughs> This shows here, group one, that the highest tissue temperature we get is when we have continuous lesions without interruptions. Group two shows a, 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 a dampen effect, and the fact you can't ever get quite to what you did with the group one lesion, even though you come back on. And it's further dampened with small inter lesion formation with interruption. So you never quite reach the level you do with continuous lesions. And this, and why do we come off? Well, we come off often because we're not comfortable with our catheter position. We're not comfortable with our stability. And so we come off quickly and end up following this pattern of interruption. And so when they look specifically, and here's represented samples of group one, two, and three, you can see the depth was greater in group one, the diameter and the volume, and it goes down in a linear fashion the more you have interruptions. So having contact, and this clearly reflects, we haven't done it yet at the, here at the University of Utah, but are planning to, the likelihood that each time we come off and stop, we're changing our thermodynamics because now we're having interplay with edema as well as a native tissue. Um, so one of the things we know is there's a, uh, we can use tissue stacking to augment lineage, uh, lesion creation. And this is a canine model where we tie thermocouples to, a, to the orifices of the pulmonary vein, came off a blade of energy here, and then watched to see how the temperature held in the, in the, in the tissue. And the tissue follows a, a capacitor curve that it holds it probably likely from cell oscillation and then it discharges it suddenly. And that happens anywhere if you go 120 seconds after 10 seconds and less so if it's six seconds. So when you consider coming, if you're going to come on and off, that the tissue will hold the energy and it gives you a chance to augment it if you do it relatively quickly, rather than a long period of time where you allow this, the tissue uh, to, to, to dissipate the energy source. And the ability of the cells to adapt and to, uh, to hold energy and to oscillate goes down as their cellular destruction. Okay. Um, so what we could see, you can, if you come back on quickly, Without interruption, you can augment your energy. And this is when we can augment in excess of 10 degrees or 20 degrees from what we're recording from the inside and the outside. So you can do it, but you can also see that the, the effect is dampened once you get to three. So most of your strength of ablation is coming in your first ablation and your second. Um, and if you do continuous and you have a summit VT that you need to reach, 
We talk about bipolar and all sorts of new strategies, but if you have a single catheter, knowing that you can stack energy sometimes can help you increase the depth and in injury. So continuous ablation lesions, coming back on quickly at termination um, can help you augment uh, lesion creation. So this is, we know power works and we know it can increase tissue temperature and lesion. Um, and as seen in the prior uh, uh, slides, as we go up on power from five to 50, we can in a unif almost a linear manner, increase the tissue temperature, but you can see an, an exaggerated uh, spot to a certain limit, and then it starts to taper off. Uh, but power itself, we can increase to increase our lesion creation. And then finally, something that uh, to consider as well is the influence of rhythm. Um, our tissue, our, our, tip, our tips are cooled now through irrigation, but our tips are also cooled by the circulating blood pool around them whether it's in the coronary sinus, if we're in that region, or the, inter, the ventricle or atrium themselves. And when, pay, when we look specifically at lesion characteristics in sinus versus atrial fibrillation, you can see the ability to heat the tissue beyond into the pulmonary vein orifice on the epicardial surface, as well as the average power that delivered was better when we're in sinus rhythm comp compared to atrial fibrillation. And so that blood point, and this is particularly important if you use uh, catheters that are dependent on, on external cooling, like eight millimeter tip catheters. When you consider somebody in fibrillation or flutter, if you're doing that on the right side, the ability to change your lesion creation by simply changing if the patient's in flutter or sinus rhythm. So I want to wrap up with this slide, which I think is a fantastic review from a Greg Mishaj group at Vanderbilt. But considering ablation, ultimately the ability to augment RF lesion size and increase transmurality, and we've spoken about some of this. I did not talk about respiratory motion, um, <clears throat> holding respiration, jet ventilation. Um, I've had little experience with that because I've always had uh, anesthesiologists that are less comfortable with that, uh, but that is something that can be done. Um, we can do, use contact force knowing that there's a sweet spot between little contact too much as important and augmenting the likelihood is consistent time of ablation and stability of the catheter. But also remember your catheter orientation oblique being less effective than uh, perpendicular, not only to cause lesion formations, uh, not only to impact lesion formation size, but also to transmit accurate information back as far as force and energy feedback. And then finally, also the role of rhythm here, cardiac rhythm, AF versus sinus rhythm. Sinus rhythm tends to be more helpful in cooling of the catheter and can impact lesion creation as well. And then finally, um, things that can be used that are surrogate, uh, pacing along your lines to make sure there's lack of capture. This also, be, there can also be lack of capture with extensive edema. And so we haven't found this quite as helpful, but Dr. Mashad's group has published on it and shown it improves outcomes. And also EGM markers, the loss of EGM splitting can be helpful as well, but are unfortunately um, uh, lack specificity. So that hopefully sums up this briefly in 15 minutes. There's much more that can be talked about as well, but that will give you a bit of a brief overview of some of the things that can be done. So the force awakens and is needed, but the force also needs five more minutes of sleep. Thank Beautiful. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bunch. That was an excellent talk. So uh, <clears throat> I don't see any questions from the audience, but uh, clearly I think uh, you, you nicely showed that the sweet spot for perfect force to ablate in the atrium or the ventricle seems to be between 10 and 20 grams. And that's the holy grail question, you know, we always get, you know, people who use robotic navigation, you know, what about contact force? And I'm sure, I mean, I know there is a decent amount of bench data that when, when you're engaging the stereotaxis or the robotic catheter, you get to a sweet spot of around 15 grams or so, which falls into your talk nicely that, you know, that creates a good lesion contact. And also, you know, with the magnetic navigation, uh, compared to a manual ablation, the catheter is always in contact with the cardiac tissue, even when the you know, 
cardiac with cardiac motion, the catheter is constantly in contact. So, so we believe that you know, with magnetic navigation, we are able to deliver a, a decent amount of you know energy and and transmittivity uh, with this catheter. Yeah, I think you're you're spot on. The ablation, the force is consistent, and you're um, and applied across the tissue as you as you move, and the stability I think uh, is an under recognized need. Um, and as I transition back to working with fellows a lot, I, I appreciate the stability I once had when I didn't have as fellows around. <laughs> Um, and having to come on and off frequently, and as the work that from Dewey has shown, coming on and off frequently is adverse. It just impacts your um, inability, your ability. Now, I think that needs to be um, said with a caveat that very high power ablation, you do have to come off quickly because that's the only way to trap to um, to uh, control your uh, depth of, of injury. So these 90 watt, 80 watt strategies. Um, we, you only can stay on a few seconds or, or they'll be hazardous. Right. Well, it looks like we have a few questions from the audience and the panelists. The so first one, uh, do you think that the construction of stiff manual catheters can ever be optimized for this task versus another modality such as magnetic contact or other new technology? Um, no, uh, uh, catheters will become less stiff as technology advances. Um, it's always a trade-off um, between a new technology that's inserted into the catheter tip and stiffness. Um, but I think what operators need to know is the, the strengths of each technology and, and to use those technology and limitations. And um, I don't necessarily use force sensing catheters when I'm working in adult congenital patients or some complex anatomy when I use manual navigation because that force sensing gives me a positive feedback of what I'm doing on the wall, but it also stiffens the catheter and I can't move as well as I can with other technologies. So I think those are there. I, I mean, they're, they're, you're looking at um, 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 remote magnetic uh, navigation that, um, that the catheter is very floppy, but you, you are at a certain force that's generated by the pull of the magnets, uh, magnetic catheters that are stiff because of new technology, but also then beam therapy and the ability to control what it's doing after it hits the tissue. So each thing has its own limitation. Okay, well, it looks like we're getting quite a bit of questions. So uh, one of the question is, I mean, we already answered how many grams of force we think sphere taxes offers, which I mentioned, you know, around 10 to 15. Um, somebody's asking, what are the parameters can you use to ensure adequate tissue contact with stereotaxis? There are clearly times when we are not in adequate contact, for example, in trichosis and valve isthmus. I think the answer can, I mean, any, anybody in the panel can answer that as well, I mean, not only not the bunch. Uh, but I, I, I believe, I mean, in, 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 on the doing a typical flutter, I mean, you can do it with the magnetic navigation. Again, the contact becomes sometimes an issue. But usually in the left atrium and the ventricles, I mean, once the, the vector is nicely placed, I think the contact is pretty good with the magnetic navigation that answers the question. Um, yeah, and I, and I think using ice, again, helps less so on the right, but on the left. You can use impedance drop. You can use some of the fundamentals of EP uh, to guide you as well, what power is being delivered. All of those aren't necessarily specific, but in aggregate, if you start using two or three, you can get a good sense of how your lesions are being formed or your likelihood of forming good lesions. Right. Another question is high power for AF using RMT catheters. Please comment on this approach. How much, how long do you use this approach? <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> we have a paper out in Heart Rhythm um, from last month comparing long-term outcomes of high power, which was 50 watts and movement about every five to 10 seconds versus um, low power, 30 watts, movement uh, at about 10 seconds, um, obviously on the posterior wall, it's truncated, showing similar rates of atrial fibrillation recurrence, uh, showing similar rates of esophageal injury, showing a slightly higher rate of atrial tachycardia long-term. Um, that type, those type of paradigms can fit, I think, with RMT as well. Um, uh, the biggest, but I think to be honest, the 
one of the challenges we faced when looking at manual manipulation of high power catheter uh, uh, strategies was stability of the catheter. And it seemed to the operators that tend towards that strategy also let the catheter move quickly in order to avoid deep injury. And, and RMT will stabilize the catheter. So with that, you would have to be very cognizant that you're moving every five to 10 seconds. And if that goes 70 watts, 90 watts, it's going to have to be shorter. And that's why 90 watts, the generator cuts off automatically. So you don't have the advantage that many high power ablationists have with a very liberal catheter movement with RMT. So you just have to take the other constant out of the power equation and that's the, uh, the, the time. You just have to be very careful with it. Right. And then, and then also the society is working on a consensus document. So hopefully it'll be out soon where we describe everybody, you know, people who have been using this system for a while in atriums and ventricles, you know, power settings, catheter moments. So hopefully that should answer some of these questions. Uh, so in keeping with time, I know we have a lot of questions going on, but we have a few more sessions. So I will have to jump to the next session. So again, thank you, Dr. Bunch. And uh, Pedram, you are next, uh, talking about floralless ablation in the robotic era. Great talk so far, by the way. Um, so I want to talk about the, um, the safety and efficacy of robotic navigation using uh, fluorless uh, technique. So if we look at the uh, amount of radiation that we expose, we are exposed to as cardiologists as, as well as we expose patients to, it is actually significant. Uh, you know, radiation exposure by cardiologists, uh, is one of the biggest sources of uh, radiation exposure to the general population. And uh, the amount is also significant. It's average about five millisievert per year for interventional cardiologists, which is, as you can see here, is equivalent to 50 chest X-ray per year. And if we do a regular AFib ablation, it is uh, averaging about 15 millisievert to the patient who don't have uh, shielding also. So, uh, the amount of absorption would be significant. And, um, and this obviously varies from uh, procedure to procedure. So um, uh, I put here some uh, averages from the European guidelines. Uh, and as you can see for AFib ablation is a huge range going from as low as uh, six uh, uh, millisievert to as high as 60 millisievert. And the significance of this is that um, for every 100 millisievert uh, radiation, uh, we have one excess uh, cancer per 100. And uh, about half of these cancers are, are fatal. There are subpopulation of patients, such as females, who have um, a higher exposure, uh, about 40% higher, and also children who are susceptible to developing cancer by about three to four times. So looking at these numbers, it becomes very imperative that we do everything we can to reduce uh, the uh, exposure. Now, the effect of the radiation on patients uh, are two, or two kinds of them. One kind is the deterministic effect, which is a, a threshold dependent. These type of effects uh, result in such injuries as cataract, skin injury, some cardiovascular uh, outcomes, negative outcomes. Um, and below the threshold, they don't cause uh, cell death and those kind of injuries. That threshold varies depending on the type of uh, side effects that we're looking at. For example, for skin lesions, we talk about two to three gray, you can think of it as Siebert as well. But for cataract and cardiovascular uh, outcomes, we're looking at much lower levels of uh, you know, 500 millisievert or uh, gray. However, the part that we are always worried about is the carcinogenesis as a result of the X-ray exposure. And that is a, um, has a stochastic uh, uh, model or effect, meaning that it's a linear non-threshold model, uh, i.e. there is no safe limit of radiation. Uh, the, as the radiation starts, the probability of developing cancer gradually goes up, but is never, never uh, zero, essentially. Besides the uh, effect on uh, carcinogenesis, uh, we have to 
deal with uh, uh, protection gear as well, which is the lead apron. And uh, we know that uh, these aprons are often heavy and it is very common for both electrophysiologists and interventional cardiologists to develop uh, all sort of uh, orthopedic injuries. This is an interesting survey it was done uh, in Canada uh, asking 70 electrophysiologists about their experience and their, their symptoms regarding the uh, orthopedic injuries. And as you can see, the uh, lumbar spondylosis prevalence is about one and a half time in electrophysiologists compared to non-electrophysiologists and cervical spondylosis is uh, four times higher in this population. Now there are things we can do to reduce radiation uh, in the lab, and uh, I'm sure uh, all of us are doing that. You know, by reducing the magnification, uh, reducing the frame rate to the minimum that is necessary, avoiding radiation to sensitive areas such as pelvic area, uh, turning on the auto exposure, avoiding uh, LAO projection when we're standing on the right side of the patient because that's where we get most of the scattered radiation trying to uh, minimize the side amount of radiation by using collimation and bringing the detector down closer to patient as much as possible, and avoiding uh, cine. Uh, uh, but remote navigation since its inception uh, has been promoted as one of the ways that we can uh, reduce amount of radiation, certainly to the physician, since they are, uh, uh, they are operator is seated in the shielded uh, control room and obviously not uh, exposed to uh, a significant amount of radiation while he's sitting there. Uh, if you look at the meta-analysis that were done, and there are multiple of them out there looking at different procedures, uh, you will see that the use of remote navigation reduces the you know, radiation exposure on average about uh, 10 minutes, whether it's an AFib ablation or a VT ablation. But I want to draw your attention to the significant heterogeneity that exists. So, uh, you know, the I score is like 99%. So there are operators, obviously, or centers where even with the use of remote navigation, uh, they still expose the patient and themselves to the significant amount of uh, radiation. So now we are entering this new era of uh, pluralist uh, ablation. And uh, um, recently, Dr. Burkhardt's group actually published uh, um, a good summary of all the published data that we have on uh, the uh, fluorless uh, methodology using manual catheter. Um, now, this is for supraventricular tachycardia, which is the bulk of the current data that we have. And although it's probably a small, you can read it here. Uh, what I want to show you is that um, uh, this can be done and has been done in variety of uh, conditions for treatment of atrial tachycardia, AVNR, TW, PW, and the procedure time, uh, which I'm going to show you another slide later, is comparable with what we uh, usually have in regular ablations and associated with very acceptable level of complications. So this is for uh, summary of supraventricular tachycardia studies. This is for ventricular tachycardias, and this study is for atrial fibrillation. Uh, one of the longer uh, studies uh, is this uh, from uh, uh, Rasminia uh, and colleagues uh, who did about 500 procedure over a five-year period and summarized the uh, result in the papers published about three years ago and has a smattering of different procedures that they did uh, using fluorless technique. Um, as you can see here, major complication rate overall was uh, very acceptable, about 1%. So out of 500 patients, five had uh, complications. Uh, four of them were tamponade. One of them was atrial uh, esophageal fissure in a patient that they did not actually use a temperature probe. Uh, uh, the procedure times also are uh, written here, which as you can see, are very comparable to the non-fluoroscopy technique. The other important thing is that if you uh, look at the trends over a year, is, uh, as you can see, the number of minutes used for the total procedure time after uh, 
doing this procedure for some time dramatically comes down essentially after about uh, four or five years is uh, is halved, uh, um, which is uh, tells you that it's very uh, experience based. So as we gain more experience, we can reduce that uh, procedure time. Now, if we assume that each procedure ha uses about 10 minutes of fluoroscopy, which I think is a very conservative estimate, just this 500 procedure by itself would reduce the exposure to the patient, in, uh, patients in general, and the physician and other personnel in the room by about 83 hours. So as you can see, although per patient, we may not uh, uh, be concerned about 10 minutes of radiation, the effects are cumulative. And if we can reduce the effects, it will have a major impact on the, at the population level by reducing the, uh, the risk of side effects, including the cancer. How about using fluoroless with the RM uh, guided ablation method? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, promises of the promises of the RM was to reduce the uh, atrial radiation exposure, but there was uh, significant heterogeneity. So wouldn't it be best if we can actually avoid the uh, fluoroscopy altogether, which would solve the issue with the orthopedic complications uh, as a result of wearing the lead? Uh, garment. So we looked at this uh, uh, in our lab and uh, we kind of divided the total procedure uh, or total procedure to different uh, sections to look at which uh, part of the procedure we use fluoroscopy predominantly. As you can see at the, oh, you can see at the bottom, the majority of fluoroscopy, which is 80% of them, uh, of the x-ray that we use is actually used in the first part, which is a non-RMT fluoroscopy time. That's where we put the catheters in the right atrium, we use the transeptal, and we use the mapping if we use the penta ray or, 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 or circular catheter. So the RMT by itself uh, would have very little extra effect on reducing the radiation if majority of the radiation actually comes from the portion of the procedure that is not uh, using RMT. So therefore, it is very imperative that we focus on eliminating a radiation and use a fluoroless technique if we want to uh, uh, have a dent, make a dent in the, uh, in the, in the x-ray exposure. So we developed this scheme, which I've shown before, uh, most of you are familiar with this, with a step-by-step -step using uh, ice and uh, uh, 3D electroanatomic mapping to get access, place catheters in the right atrium, uh, use our uh, get a transeptal, and then continue monitoring the uh, procedure efficacy and impossible complication with the eyes. And I show you a couple of pictures. For example, uh, this is how we obtain the transeptal. Uh, we use ice to, uh, uh, to localize the septum and place the, the tip of the catheter uh, and then pass the, uh, the transeptal wire and then we'll push the sheet over. As you can see, you can see exactly when you cross the septum with the sheet and when you can take out the dilator. Uh, you can even uh, optimize the location you wanna go transeptal, which would be closer or opposite of the pulmonary veins. Uh, this is another one uh, showing uh, you using ice how to, uh, localize the catheter in the left atrium to uh, uh, localize the pulmonary veins to determine the osseum of the uh, branches of the say right pulmonary vein and then when we come for ablation to make sure that we have adequate contact so it guides us for, uh, to a mapping and it also guides us to a more efficient ablation so we'll look at the effect of this in a time series manner to uh, to see how the procedure time was affected when we implemented the fluoroless method. So the, there were about 60 odd procedures, 30 of them were prior to the uh, implementation of the fluoroless uh, technique, and then the other three was afterwards. And as you can see, immediately after uh, fluoroless technique was implemented, there was some increase in the procedure time in the first part of it, which was access and mapping time by about 16 um, 16 or 17 minutes. And after that, there was uh, a gradual, albeit a slow decline in the procedure time. That, however, was 
counterbalanced by about 17 minute reduction in the, to in the uh, RMT ablation time. And we sort of um, thought about what would be the mechanism of this. And likely it's because when you use, we depend on ice, we can see the catheter better. We can uh, uh, obtain a better transeptal. We can uh, confirm contact and those sort of thing. And at the end of the day, when we combine the two together and we look at the total procedure time, there was actually about five minute difference and that five minute did not reach a statistical significance. So even at the beginning of it, even without having a significant experience in doing this procedure, uh, you will not be affected dramatically by the uh, use of floral, floralist technique in terms of your procedure time. So did a quick meta-analysis of this comparing the procedure times uh, over a year using fluoroless method um, as you can see, the, uh, the RM and guided ablation, um, although this is obviously, uh, it's not a comparator, it's just the app comparing the averages, uh, is comparable. In fact, you, you could even say that is, uh, the point estimate is better than the uh, manual floorless uh, uh, technique. And the other interesting thing is the issue of uh, time. As you can see, as the uh, we did the metric regression, as you see, as the, not, uh, as the years progress, the total procedure time using Florida is coming down, which again tell us that as we get better with the technology, as the technology also gets better, the mapping techniques and other things, the, the procedure time uh, will come down. So in summary, uh, fluoroscopy during EP is, uh, is a significant health hazard to physician, nurses, and patients. Uh, result in excess cancer risk, uh, non-cancer related uh, side effects such as cataract, orthopedic complication, and uh, fluoroless ablation techniques uh, are safe as I showed you in multiple summaries and meta-analysis and very effective. And the fluoroless RM and, uh, guided ablation is also feasible, safe, and efficient. In fact, I showed you that it's probably more efficient than the uh, uh, the manual catheter, just partly because it's a safer, softer catheter. And uh, if uh, you don't have a visual contact, it's almost impossible to cause perforation. And the procedural times are not significantly affected by adoption of floorless method. Um, it, would be, it would affect different parts of the procedure, uh, but the total procedure time overall is not affected. So thank you for attention. Thank you, Pedro. Appreciate your talk. That was a great. So uh, we have one question. Can you comment on what mapping system you use? Also, how do you manipulate the ice catheter when you are in the control room? You want to take that, Pedro? Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, uh, the, the RM and catheter uh, room that we have uh, is equipped with the CARTO system. But there are other uh, programs and there are other papers that published that use Navix and other mapping systems. So it's probably compatible with all of them. Uh, so to, to get the transeptal access, obviously uh, I'm in the room doing the procedure so I, I can manipulate the ice catheter. Uh, once the uh, RMT catheter is placed in the left atrium, we already have a geometry uh, on our uh, electroanatomic map. So we really, really don't need the ice catheter uh, for the majority part of, most part of the ablation. But the, if there are issues with, uh, for example, not being able to, achieve, uh, to reach a particular point or if the ablation is unsuccessful, then uh, uh, you know, one of us come to the room and uh, rotate the catheter. If you have the V drive, obviously, or other uh, the, uh, robotic uh, system where it can man manipulate the ice catheter, then that would obviate the need for coming back to the room to do that. But realistically, very rarely, we have to come back to uh, manipulate the ice once your map is there and once your uh, ablation is started. Uh, the one exception is that sometimes for the right veins, uh, because I use ice, uh, I use the agilis catheter, I have to bend the sheet towards the right veins to facilitate the ablation in the right side and to see that I can safely bend the uh, agilis sheet and not damaging any structures, I come in, obviously I use ice at that time, but that's very rare. Majority of time you can do it without moving the ice. Perfect, and that's have been experienced, our experience as well, you know, the, the floater times with the RMTs are pretty short. It's usually what, when before putting the catheter, 
also on the Odyssey system, you know, there are other uh, tools available. Uh, so people who are used to look at the fluoros, you can take an LAO and an Aureo shot of the cardiac silhouette, and uh, you can transfer that data into the Odyssey system. And when you move your catheter, the RMG catheter, it can, you can see on the fluoro, on the, the shots you took, without actual fluoring, how the catheter is behaving inside the heart. So there are tools, you know, to show the catheter on a fluoro screen without actually using the fluoro. Uh, but this has been a similar experience. Um, so Pete is asking, how do you manage tortuous femoral vessels placing the wire into the SVC before transeptal, et cetera? So good question. Um, uh, there are ver various methods you can use. Uh, one is that you can actually map the venous system, so from the groin all the way up, and then if you're using a, 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 an ice catheter which has mapping capability, you just follow that. The second, if the wire does not go up, you can uh, use ice to find the branches of the vein. And uh, I had a video, I didn't put it in here just for the brevity of the talk, uh, but you can actually find the branches of the femoral vein and move the catheter with the eye simultaneously to direct uh, your catheter to the right atrium. When it gets to the right atrium, we create an electroanatomic map of the right atrium and coronary sinus. You can use um, your pentaray or you can use your decanab, some mapping catheter, uh, or you can use even RMT if you want. But since we don't want to bring the magnet in so quickly, I just use the pentaray. And then that we use the os of the CS, which was identified by Pentare to put a decapolar catheter in the coronary sinus. Okay. And the question about the, the mapping system, I know traditionally it's the Cardo from Biosense Webster, which is integrated with the serotaxis. I have personally experienced with Boston Scientific with the Rhythmia. Again, it's not integrated, but you can do the procedures with the same uh, technology, just like with the Navex. I know Pete's will be, Pete, Pete Weiss will be talking about uh, another mapping system shortly. Uh, so, so there is a movement in uh, you know, having other companies joining the robotic magnetic navigation uh, integration. So hopefully we'll see something new in the near future. Um, is there a difference using ICE versus TE? Somebody's asking that question during the procedure. Uh, I haven't done it with TE. Uh, uh, it's probably a bit more difficult because you can use TE, for example, to uh, you know look at the femoral vein and the access from the groin, those sort of things. So then you uh, you will be pushing the catheter essentially blindly. Um, that perhaps is not safe, so I wouldn't recommend it. The part that is intracardiac, though, I mean, you can definitely get transeptal access using TE if you have to do it. Uh, but uh, for general access, we have to start from the beginning of the case, obviously, uh, accessing vein, which I use the echo, and then moving the catheter up, which I use ice, then you would need the ice catheter. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Pedro. All right. We're going to go across the Atlantic now to Netherlands uh, with Tomas Ali Torok. He's going to talk about man beats robot or robot beats man. Um, and I'm uh, happy to represent Europe today <laughs> uh, and also congratulate for, uh, for the previous um, great talks. And today I will uh, cover a very interesting talk. Um, it sounds very aggressive at the beginning, but um, you will see it's um, all about science. Man beats robot or robot beats man and um, that um, will be implemented in the efficiency of robotic ablation. These are my disclosures. Uh, and um, let's start with um, this movie. Um, I suppose it um, considers considered to be a fair use, but I also on the, that slide tried to make an appropriate um, a citation of the movie. So it was placed in 2019 by uh, Corridor Digital. And um, so that goes about men versus uh, robots. Now let's see how was the electrophysiology in 2003. So obviously, at that time, um, man was able to beat robots, as you can see, even quite easily. Look at this. By the way, my 
the, the advantage of this digital symposium that my wine glass is just behind the uh, computer. So let's move to 2020. And then you can see that things can suddenly change. So today I would like to uh, actually convince you guys and the audience that um, in some aspects, robots can already beat uh, humans. So um, let's go back also in history in science. Um, this is the very first uh, large patient series that we published in 2011. And you know, Erasmus Medical Center was one of the first centers in the world um, uh, who uh, started to use uh, a kind of robotic technology, and that was the Stereotaxis um, uh, um, Magnetic Navigation System in 2003, 2004. And uh, of course, at the beginning, the numbers are growing slowly, but in 2010, we finished this retrospective analysis and we were actually very curious to see what happened in the last um, seven years and we were able to publish this in 2011. Um, two things about this slide. So when we look at the uh, all kind of arrhythmias that we treated with uh, the stereotaxy system, you can, uh, you can almost see no difference in efficacy, um, magnetic navigation as compared to manual uh, ablations. It is uh, so that in the VT ablations, already in that time, we had a slightly higher success rate using magnetic navigation. And when it comes to procedural efficiency, we, let's say, we, we were a little bit disappointed because um, um, in most arrhythmias, it didn't provide any significant um, advantage. On the other hand, I always thought it's a very nice system to use. It has a lot of advantages for the operator. And let's uh, move together with the industry and, and start a project to make this um, uh, technology uh, better uh, also for the patients. And um, I'm very happy that many of the improvements were first implemented in Erasmus Emsen and together with, um, especially in the last time with David, we could um, uh, achieve uh, quite uh, nice results. And I would like to present to you in this short talk, uh, three latest papers of us uh, with uh, three, I suppose I can call, call it quite robust data. And um, uh, this data will cover the following. Um, I will share some data on VT ablation, on pediatrics, and atrial fibrillation ablation. So when we would like to define what is the optimal catheter ablation method, uh, being that robot or manual, it doesn't matter. It should be effective. It should be fast. The procedure should be quick, especially nowadays when we have uh, such a pressure on our healthcare system. It should be safe. Today, we didn't talk about safety, but from the very beginning on, this technology uh, was associated with safety. And the very early papers were agreeing on one thing, at least, even the procedures were long, that they were always safer than the manual procedures. Uh, the lesions we make should be permanent. Therefore, the effect should be long lasting. And, um, and good technology should be able to control lesion sizes in different anatomical locations. You will hear it today from David. And um, again, one of the most important things, and that's why I also personally invent, um, invested in uh, robotics, we have to improve, improve reproducibility of the procedures. Procedure should not rely on the manuality of the operators. So let's start with atrial fibrillation. Uh, we recently published this paper in the Journal of Atrial Fibrillation with our fellow um, Annemarie. And um, as I told you, it's a quite a lot of data, but the basic principle and the basic concept is the following. We developed in the last three years um, a kind of modified approach to a fast and effective pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, this approach includes using a new module uh, developed by Stereotaxis, the e-contact module, using it together with the feature of ablation history, which was already available. Um, 
we believe in the high definition of PV anatomy as a very important uh, feature in uh, this uh, system. And we started to use higher power settings than in the past. I didn't put on this slide, but I was very uh, happy with the previous biophysics talks because we also use continuous uh, lesions as you will see. Now, I call this as a latest generation R uh, RMT of RMN procedure. And we compare this to first generation RMT procedure. But having said this, we also compared the data to latest generation manual and cryo procedures, as well as first generation manual and cryo procedures. To fully understand what I mean, I show you here a short movie about the way how we perform um, pulmonary vein isolation nowadays in our lab. You can see a typical screen of the Odyssey. This is very familiar uh, for all of the uh, people using magnetic navigation. This is a large screen from the Odyssey system. And uh, uh, in principle, you can have um, many inputs on this screen and you can put uh, on the screen whatever you want. Uh, during the ablation, I focus on this left lower panel. I hope it can be seen where my, uh, where I move this sign. And I make the cartomet that, that I made earlier very transparent. And I just focus on the ablation history, which is this orange color. And there is this little catheter tip, which is moving continuously. And around this, there is the e-contact module. And later I will talk a little, little bit about it, how it works. Um, as you can see, we don't stop uh, energy delivery and uh, at the bottom of this screen I put for you guys the most important uh, uh, aspects of this ablation so um, the position of positioning of the catheter is always based on the contact indicator I don't use carto tech points maybe um, you can use visitex but it doesn't add anything to this procedure always a uh, VACA and I try to do both veins in one circle. We always use a uh, deflectable sheet. It can be a um, stereotaxis sheet but also can be edgeless. As I said, I drag circumferential lines and um, posterior wall 45 watts minimum and anterior wall 50 watts minimum with the standard settings. So when we look at this and uh, you look at first generation versus latest generation technologies, of course, it's not a surprise that all techniques improved in a time. So when you look at manual A versus B of the cryo balloon that's in the middle and the remote magnetic navigation, in terms of procedure time, all procedures became shorter. On the other hand, which is striking that um, the magnitude of the shortening of the procedures uh, was the largest in the remote magnetic navigation group. And this is exactly the same when you look at the uh, magnetic, uh, uh, the, the uh, mean ablation time. And I think the most important, um, and ex actually it was slightly surprising for me, is the first pass isolation rate. Um, it became so high, um, nowadays it's even above 90%, that um, I'm very um, uh, convinced that we can do uh, PV isolation without continuous monitoring of the PV signals in, in certain settings, like when you work uh, together with Equipus. So again, what you can see, these are only the latest generations. And what you can see, um, the left pulmonary veins and the right pulmonary veins and the first pass isolation rate, which is uh, in this study was uh, almost 80%. And surprisingly low in cryo and very low in manual, meaning that even if you use the latest contact for sensing techni technologies, you, you must do some touch-ups in most of the cases. The second group I wanted to show you where we can already beat uh, men is the pediatric ablations. 
In Erasmus MC, uh, for the pediatric population, we use uh, again the same three uh, techniques manual guided um, uh, radio frequency ablation, rio ablation, and remote magnetic navigation guided radio frequency ablation. We do quite a lot of pe uh, pediatric cases. In that series, we could um, um, analyze data of 310 children uh, who underwent almost 400 procedures. So that means um, 63 redo procedures are also included. And we excluded uh, from the analysis the children who had only electrophysiology study. And we did a comparative analysis of the cat uh, catheter ablation outcomes of the 277 first procedures. Uh, the distribution was, um, of course, we are biased. It's a retrospective analysis. So we do mostly remote magnetic navigation, but we um, do quite a lot manual and cryo ablation in the past. So here are the most important data. Uh, it's not a surprise that in a pediatric population, most patients had AV nodal reentry tachycardias of AVRTs, but we did quite a few VTs, um, uh, atypical flutters, atrial tachycardias. Where you see the real difference um, is the um, uh, fluoroscopy time. It's uh, not a surprise. The fluoroscopy dose and um, even the acute success. It is very interesting to uh, recognize that, um, uh, at least in our center, there was not much of a difference between the success rates and the fluoroscopy times in the remote magnetic navigation and the manual procedures, while the cryoablations um, were uh, less successful acutely. And um, the other important thing, uh, when you look at the progression of the procedure times over the time, only in the remote magnetic navigation group, you see the same line that I showed you in the adult atrial fibrillation population, despite the fact that this is a completely different uh, uh, patient population. There is a straight line uh, with a decreasing procedure time, and that kind of trend you don't see in the manual RF procedures, and um, especially not in the cryo procedures. In a long-term follow-up, um, when you look at redo procedures, especially when you put um, together that um, some of them had uh, uh, secondary arrhythmias, there were much less redo procedures in the, in the remote magnetic navigation group than in the manual group, and the most um, recurrences occurred in the cryo group. And this is despite the fact that uh, we treated with cryo almost only AV nodal tachycardias. Very rarely we do uh, did in the past, um, uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, a left-sided pathway. So actually, a few years ago, uh, we already stopped cryoablation. And this is very interesting because when you look at pediatricians, they keep doing cryo. And in centers, when uh, the pediatric ablations are performed by Adult electrophysiologist, I suppose we, we mostly use uh, radio frequency energy. And, and the complication rate is not uh, high. The last group I would like to talk to, to you is the ventricular tachycardias. Uh, but I changed here the title a little bit because um, it, is an also, it is also an important aspect that the, that the technology should continuously improve. So I just changed it to robot beats robot. In an interesting study, which is being published right now, we compared the VT ablations with uh, and without um, the e-contact. So in the last um, 25 patients that we treated before this analysis, we were able to implement the e-contact module and we compared it to the uh, other VT ablations in our centers, the two center study actually, we included a center uh, OLVG from Amsterdam using this module. This module is, um, I think now it's most of the people aware, even if you don't use it, this is a um, module which uh, shows you the um, uh, contact uh, um, quality. It's a three state contact detector and it shows to you no contact, contact, and optimal contact. 
and uh, you can see which parameters are uh, taken into consideration during that. So here is an example. I hope you can see it. It's not the best slide. It's just a um, um, slide out of our uh, Clary system. So this is a scar homogenization procedure and you see um, the ablation history on the left side of the um, screen. And in the upper part, you see a suboptimal contact and here you see an optimal contact. And when you focus on the impedance drop, it is very clear that during the ablation here, there is actually no change in the impedance. It's a straight line. While with an optimal contact during the ablation, you see the optimal uh, impedance drop that we expect during the good ablations. And here you can see this uh, in another uh, slide. So in this analysis, we included 145 patients. And as I told you, only 25 had unfortunately um, e-contact module and we compared it to historical 120 patients. Um, the reviewer asked actually a sub-analysis uh, about uh, because uh, he found that the um, difference is quite big between the numbers and it is true on the other hand that made it actually demographically uh, homogeneous uh, and comparable population but um, we also did a sub-analysis uh, um, with 30 patients, the last 30 patients without uh, ECM. And actually I can tell you it didn't change anything at it, and it will be included into the paper. So here is the conclusion of that paper. It's also a lot of data and a lot of tables will be published, but this is just the major message. What you can see, even the robot beat uh, robot because the robotic technology should evolve, should improve itself. And just implementing the e-contact feature, uh, at least in our center, in Erasmus Medical Center, improved the VT-free uh, survival. It, um, of course, in like most VT studies, it doesn't have an uh, influence on the one-year mortality, but in a recurrence rate, there is a very uh, a significant difference between the ECM plus versus ECM mean patients. So my conclusions are the following, that um, robotic and remote ablation is the most consistently developing catheter ablation technique. Uh, hopefully it stays like that. Uh, robotic ablation already outclasses manual ablations already at some specific patient groups, um, either in efficacy, um, outcome or efficiency. But um, we all know that further improvements are necessary, uh, especially when we would like to talk about the robots. So we need to invest in um, automation, some workflow improvement, and, um, uh, and some mapping. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Tomas. That was an excellent talk. Again, you've been the leader uh, in this technology, and you know, thanks for sharing your data. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, is the e-contact module dependent on Cardo or is it open platform? Um, so um, um, the, it is, of course, it was first available in Cardo. I wouldn't call it open platform, but um, uh, in the industrial partners uh, op opted to work together with stereotaxis. It is a feature which will be available. And at this moment, there is one additional mapping system, the Equitus system, uh, which is integrated. Um, uh, and uh, it, on the Equitus system, it's also available. And like David, yeah. David and other David. partners will join this effort. It will be available on those as well. Right. David is- uh, uh, Just quickly, it's also on, at this point, not yet FDA approved for use in the US but we hope to have that before too long. Right. Okay. And then- I'm not uh, happy to hear that. Um, Tomasz, can you comment, comment on the learning curve for these procedures? How long does it take to get to that level of efficiency as yours? Um, very good question. I think uh, David in, in his first talk actually answered this. Um, 
One of the most important issue regarding this is that um, the learning curve was underestimated in the first five, six years of the history of um, uh, stereotaxis. Um, it, it, it needs a very special training. And of course it helps if somebody is already a trained electrophysiologist, but uh, the biophysics, um, the, the, the physical parameters of the catheter, navigation, it, it requires skills. I cannot, I cannot uh, tell you exact numbers because in some, pa in some people it would be 20, in others uh, 200. Um, I have my own uh, impression that uh, it's, it's only a feeling, but the, the people who are good manually, um, and this is the bad news, <laughs> they are usually uh, learning this technology also very easily. So it, it's, it's probably it's the brain to hand uh, connection rather than the hands itself, which, uh, which determines both kinds of procedures, the manual and, and this procedure. But again, um, conclusion is a lot of effort should be done in, in the training as we heard it from David. Thanks, Dimash. Uh, one of the questions is, do you have a sense of how many pediatric hospitals have ready access to RMN? And I know we have uh, Professor Sabine Erst in our uh, attendance, so I've opened the mic to her. So hopefully she can uh, comment on that, Dr. Ernst. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> I was a bit late to come into this. I'm, I apologize. It was a bit difficult to connect. Um, I think you know, I've, I've used this in pediatric cases for, uh, I think, 13, 14 years, and I see I have this essentially a very similar experience to Tamash. I think overall, maybe because I use a lot of 3D image integration, I have even lesser fluoroscopy exposure. I think that's it's a very good argument for using stereotaxis or magnetic navigation for pediatric cases. So I think the learning curve, as, as Tamash has said, is relatively short because you have, if you have experience with your hands, you basically can see and look at the electrogram from your catheter even better than you are when you're scrubbed in. Uh, having said that, I, I have a number of fellows that I trained on magnets first. I never did a manual ablation and did their very first ablation with robots, which actually is very nice because you can train them very nicely, sit right next to them and you make them understand what they need to look for. And then the opposite way is true. If they know how to do it magnetically, getting their catheter there manually later on is also easier. So I think it's actually is an excellent tool for training. Um, young fellows, and I always recommend that uh, the youngest person should join the Steel Texas team because that's they typically have computer game experience, so it makes it easy to train them. It's harder to train older people in doing this well, so that's at least my experience. Thank you, Dr. Ernst. I have yeah, few experience about with the, it. Dr. About the actual numbers, I don't know, but probably David from Steel Texas he knows much better how many centers doing pediatrics with it but I, I don't I don't have the Sabine do you know um do you know how many centers do a uh, kind of uh, congenital pediatric work like you and obviously uh, Dr. Cooper at WashU there's some uh, work on that uh, obviously in Montreal there's a, a very significant amount of work like that uh, in addition obviously to, to Professor Ernst um, I, mm -hmm. I actually don't have a great feeling you you might know better I think there's, I would say, I would nominate Munich, Montreal, um, Rotterdam, of course, um, ourselves. In the US, I'd, I'm, I'm not sure about UCLA. I think they do quite a lot. Um, maybe if someone is on the call as well, but um, I, you know, pediatric and congenital typically is something that not everyone does. And there's, it's not. Te Texas Children's Hospital uses the system as well. It seems like there's probably about a half a dozen in the US as well. Thank you. I mean, I have little experience, but I can tell you from my limited experience with adult congenital, the, the, the beauty of the magnetic catheter is, I mean, it, you can curve it, bend it in multiple different degrees of freedom. It's just impressive. And the manual catheters cannot reach these complex anatomies. So, yeah. uh, it, so this is really something I could echo as well. Um, you know, that's why I love it for congenital heart disease. You can forget about access problems. You can get to any place. It's just a matter of uh, following a suitable path inside the chamber that you are targeting. So that, and with image integration, um, you know, that's that's the trick. That's how I can do these patients 
that are otherwise undoable. You know, there's many, many people where you don't even have a transbuckle option because there's no such thing in them. So um, I think zero taxes offers a unique platform. As you all know, it's nice to be in an organization when, when everyone uh, around you is smarter than you. So I'm getting uh, an infinite amount of, uh, of, uh, of text messages from our team, uh, UCLA, Oregon, Texas, uh, Bad Onhausen, uh, UC Davis, multiple yeah. sites that use, um, use it. Um, uh, and obviously, um, yeah, Wash U, um, uh, kind of uh, that use the system. Glad to hear. Just, just one more comment. Um, in that analysis, of course, um, it was only pediatrics, almost like standard SVTs, small children. We also made analysis uh, with um, uh, different weight groups, groups, and this was not about congenital. So that, uh, and this is very interesting because um, I, I like, I love to do the children, the small children, with this. Perfect. Well, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Tens. I think that's a great point because, uh, you know, using it for conventional SVT uh, in the pediatric population seems like a, you know, a perfect application, and, you know, across the U.S. Certainly there's a lot of cryo use uh, still going on uh, for run-of-the-mill AVNRT and, um, and kiddos and, um, you know, Tomas's data is, is uh, reproducible uh, in those centers. It can make a large impact on, on recurrences. All right. Well, thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Dr. Ernst, for pitching in. So uh, we'll move on to David Burkhardt from Texas, uh, who's sitting on a beach, and he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, summit PVCs and VT and using magnetic navigation. David? How are you doing? I'm trying to get this up. Let's see if you can uh, see it. So uh, I'll add on the last talk, we do probably 10 to 20 pediatrics and adult congenitals uh, per year, specifically referred or stereotaxis, uh, some, some VTs, some congenital disease, but, uh, uh, but yeah, but quite a bit, uh, uh, but a fair amount, but yeah, stereotaxis definitely would, uh, uh, makes these cases much better. I'm gonna, uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I like this better than the uh, 5.30 a.m. Uh, HRS uh, conferences, certainly. Uh, I'm going to talk about my approach to these uh, summit and high uh, outflow tract uh, PVCs and, and VT uh, that is, you know, kind of developed over time. And stereotaxis has certainly been integral to this and uh, makes this a lot easier. I'll say that uh, the uh, summit area PVC and VT is probably my largest referral from other electrophysiologists for failed uh, ablation. And I'll try to talk about how uh, we were able to overcome a lot of that. Also, I'm also referred these for epicardial ablation, but they're pretty much never epicardial, and we'll also discuss that. Uh, the majority of normal heart PVCs emanate from this area. It's really where everything comes together in the heart, and these are in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the anatomy is certainly complicated. You have to check the RVOT, pulmonic cusp, aortic cusp, uh, the uh, LVOT, particularly the aortic continuity area and the anterior cardiac vein runs into there too. And it can emanate directly in between all of these structures. We've demonstrated this by uh, electroanatomic timing, wire mapping, and things like that. Uh, and uh, uh, Luigi published uh, one of our papers on ablation of multiple sites talking uh, about this. Uh, here we'll kind of discuss the uh, anatomy and here's kind of what you see and it's really in between where the, the great vessels come together. You can see part of why this, uh, from an epicardial standpoint, you really can't get there because it's in between and behind these things. Uh, here the uh, anterior portion, the uh, right ventricular outflow tract, and that you see how these uh, uh, behind it, uh, the left coronary cusp, and you see how these uh, interact with each other and uh, where, uh, where those locations uh, are. Uh, also important to check above and below on, on both of these and really to get to this uh, location. Here again, just seeing how these, uh, uh, these areas are together and that this is really the very top of the septum. Uh, here showing from a superior view kind of what we're talking about. Uh, there you see the aortic cusps. Uh, here you see the pulmonic cusps. Uh, here, the left main into LAD, uh, and also the associated with the microvalve here. And really, this location 
Uh, you know, you see this in, in this view, but certainly it extends uh, superiorly and inferiorly uh, from this. But all the, this involves, you know, the architecture and the skeleton of the heart, particularly the, uh, the micro valve and the great vessels. Uh, here on uh, CT, you see the associated right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, here, the uh, coronary uh, uh, cusp, and you see this area here, which I'll show you on ice, and this is actually a very important area, and that when you see this, this is something you're looking for, uh, and this actually is uh, an area where uh, a lot of these uh, tend to emanate from, and here, just another uh, view of, of uh, where this is coming out, the coronary cusp, and you see its association with the uh, uh, with the artery there. And once again, another uh, view of this and, and really what we're talking about in, in this location and its association again with the, uh, the close association with the mitral valve. And then uh, how the vein uh, wraps around in that uh, location. Uh, just uh, the EKG clues to this location. Basically, if it's wide and notched, it's probably not coming from there. This it tends to have a more septal uh, outbreak, and so it tends to be uh, more uh, narrow and less notchy uh, in general. And so, if you see wide and notching, you're dealing tend to uh, deal more with the uh, right ventricular outflow tract and more along the interior portion uh, of this. Uh, the outflow tract and summit. The mapping is really the most important portion of this. Important to map all of these sites. Important to have the electrograms gained up because uh, you may see very small electrograms that are incredibly important of these, uh, in these. And multiple ablation uh, sites may be needed, but the mapping uh, is really the most important. And just like uh, Jared talked about in his talk earlier, you get edema very early uh, with ablation. And if you get edema in this location, you are done if, you, if you're not on the, uh, your optimal site before you get ablating. And, and actually, I think that's one of the reasons for the referrals that I get quite a bit is that people uh, approach this by starting in the RV and start burning there. And once you have edema in this area, you probably won't be able to get it from the other locations. Here, as I said, the anterior cardiac vein. Uh, comes uh, into this location. Uh, important to map that. And stereotaxis certainly makes that uh, much easier. And then here you see uh, uh, this location, and this is multiple maps. Uh, this includes an epicardial map, but also uh, right ventricular endocardial map, left ventricular endocardial map. And uh, you don't see them very well up here, but a uh, coronary cusp uh, map also in that location and uh, ablations from multiple sites uh, in this. Here you see a pure epicardial map. You don't appreciate it, but on, uh, on this, this location, you just really can't get there epicardially. Uh, my former research fellow, uh, Pasquale Santangeli, uh, published uh, on this. If you're coming from the true summit, uh, electrocardiographically, if you, basically if you have any R wave in uh, one or AVL, uh, you, uh, there's really no epicardial component uh, to that uh, uh, in this location. And it's very rare I see uh, success from the epicardium. The other thing to consider is I showed you that it really emanates between the great vessels. Uh, surgeons have actually known this for quite a while. And if you talk to an old surgeon who's, who's done uh, VT ablation from this location, the way they approach it is actually they do a superior approach coming uh, basically from the head looking down in between the great vessels and then that's where they do uh, the ablation and so that's just a place we can't get to uh, epicardially in general here you see these multiple maps i have stacked uh, one upon uh, another uh, the uh, the red you see the earliest activation and relatively similar timing in all uh, all of these which uh, will likely require ablation from more than one spot this I put up, this is more typical uh, RV type of VT. And the reason I put this up is that just there are just some fundamental differences in how these things act. Uh, right ventricular uh, uh, outflow tract stuff tends to act just like this. It tends to just have these bursts, you know, three to four beat runs, occasionally longer. Uh, and uh, the, the true summit area, you don't see much true VT from. 
unless it's a septal myopathy, which extends uh, further down. Uh, the summit just tends to give you just uh, incessant uh, PVCs that, uh, 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 that really don't change over time. They just tend to be really incessant and, and uh, rarely come in the form of VT. Um, here you see the right ventricular outflow tract and just its relation uh, to that. Uh, the infundibular muscle of the right ventricular outflow tract is uh, what's most frequently involved in the RVOT type of uh, VTs. Uh, Stereotaxis actually is very nice for those because you can map both the superior and inferior aspect of that infundibular muscle, uh, which uh, can be very difficult with uh, manual and sometimes. Uh, Another EKG thing, if you see an R wave that's taller in lead three than two, then you're probably talking about a super, super pulmonic uh, location uh, uh, in those cases. Uh, here you see, you know, more, uh, a little, the other transition is usually helpful. You tend to see a little bit of an earlier R wave in V2 for the true, um, uh, for the true summit type of uh, locations. Uh, here, this one's more in three, and this was more of a right ventricular uh, septal uh, type of PVC. Uh, here you see another, once again, a little bit of an R wave in one. Patient has a right bundle in the, in the beginning, very early transition uh, in V1. And so this actually put it more to the left side, more around the aortic mitral continuity uh, uh, in this case, which... Uh, in general, is sort of the bottom of what I consider the uh, summit area, but can be very important in ablation uh, of that location. Uh, here you see kind of the hooking pattern with a manual catheter. This is an old figure I wanted to show you under uh, the cusp. Uh, the reason I wanted to show this is that uh, you see a, a, uh, a cardiac catheterization catheter in the uh, left main coronary artery and just showing you the uh, uh, the, uh, the location of this, and it tends to be really directly under that and directly under the valve that you want to get to. With stereotaxis, the best maneuver uh, for this is to actually go uh, via a retrograde approach, uh, go into the ventricle, make a loop, and pull the loop back up, and that gives you very good contact force uh, in this location. And I'll tell you with a manual catheter, uh, this is a very difficult uh, thing to hold on to on, on some occasions, particularly if it extends out more anteriorly. Uh, it's very difficult to hold on. And uh, even some of my colleagues, uh, uh, the, uh, the contact force catheters that are a little more stiff can make this, uh, make this area very difficult to get to. Uh, here, a, another one. Uh, from the, uh, one of our older papers looking at this, and that you see uh, here an epicardial catheter and here in the left coronary cusp, which was actually the uh, best site. You don't want to appreciate the distance between this, uh, but really that's as close as, you can, uh, as close as you can get, but it's actually not that close when you look at it. Now here's the uh, ice image uh, I wanted to talk to you about, and really the straight up and down, what we refer to as the home image. Uh, I think is very helpful. And that uh, here, the left coronary cusp, the left main tends to uh, rise up here. And this area that you see on ice tends to be the area where almost all these arrhythmias uh, emanate from. And so you can see ablation on this side from the left coronary cusp. If you come underneath the aromatra continuity coming there, and then the pulmonic cusp on this side uh, is actually the superior portion there. Uh, here, just another view showing you in the left coronary cusp, and you can, uh, of course, put Doppler on and uh, show where the left main is to make sure you're not too high. Just as a, uh, just as a keynote, nothing comes from the left main. Uh, the left main is, has a large atrial signal uh, and minimal ventricular signal. The left coronary cusp has a very small atrial signal and a large uh, ventricular signal. And um, like I said, you will nothing maps, even atrial tachycardia, nothing maps are released uh, to the left main. And so there's really no reason to ever uh, be in that to ablate in it. But once again, in this view, I just wanted to show you the pulmonary artery and that location there uh, can once again be very important when you're ablating these. And here you actually see the lesion forming in that location. 
And uh, as I said, that's something to keep, uh, keep in mind when you have uh, ice. Here's the left coronary cusp. Uh, this is stereotaxis via retrograde approach uh, into the left coronary cusp. Here, like I said, I like to see the catheter there on ice. Uh, in addition, you tend to get uh, very nice electrograms, but very important to have the electrograms gained, uh, gained up uh, quite a bit uh, on these. Uh, here, I uh, just want to talk about pacing from the left coronary cusp. Occasionally, you get fantastic pacing that looks like this. Occasionally, it will also be not a very good pace map, but your earliest activation and still can be a successful site. The other thing to consider is, uh, I think I have uh, one here, once again, in the left coronary cusp, and you can see the, the pictures there. Uh, but uh, in, uh, uh, when Pasquale uh, was my uh, research fellow, we also uh, had, uh, had this presented at HRS. But if you have a long stem to QRS from the, uh, from the left coronary cusp with really a 100% match on that, that is, that is successful ablation site 100% of the time. And so just something to consider a long stem to QRS, but that means that the, uh, and you'll see on the next slide, that uh, the site is actually likely here, not directly on the left coronary cusp, but in between and on MRI and other data, we've seen this uh, scar type tissue, connective tissue in between that, uh, that explains some of this. So again, always consider nearby structures, as I said, complete mapping of the RV, the pulmonic cusp, the aortic cusp, the anterior vein, and the subcusp uh, area. Uh, wire mapping of the veins can also uh, be useful to uh, just help you get in the, the closest location as possible. Uh, your first lesion has to be your best lesion, just as I've talked, as, uh, as was uh, discussed earlier, because once you get edema in that, uh, you really can't deliver as deeply. And then uh, microscar can actually uh, alter your activation mapping. So look for those low amplitude signals. Pace mapping may have variable QRS morphology in these locations. And as I said, uh, if you get a long stem to QRS from the left cusp, uh, that, uh, that is an excellent site, even if your activation mapping is relatively poor. Uh, if your activation mapping is equal on several sides, and particularly not greater than 40 milliseconds pre-QRS, then you're likely gonna to have to ablate on multiple sides to, to be uh, successful. Um, and uh, multi-site ablation can be certainly successful uh, with these. Here's in this area, which you know, is I kind of referred to as the true summit, which, uh, which I consider the suprapulmonic uh, area, and that you see a relatively narrow uh, QRS, uh, slight R wave in lead one. And this is the signal I think you're really looking at and that you see uh, uh, this is actually from the pulmonic cusp. Uh, and that you see this trailing signal there that becomes uh, early with this. And this is 65 milliseconds early. So this is uh, significantly uh, early and the best site of this. Uh, here you see the multiple maps, including the left coronary cusp and the pulmonic cusp. Pulmonic cusp was the earliest in this location. And here you see stereotaxis in the pulmonic cusp. And so this is very important. There is no location other than being in the left main that is closer to the left main than the pulmonic cusp. And so uh, it's been reported that ablation in the pulmonary artery can cause, uh, uh, can cause left main uh, damage. Uh, this, uh, it actually kind of looks like it's coming retrograde aortic, but no, this is actually going into the RV. I made a loop above the pulmonary artery, and I bring the tip of this catheter down into the pulmonic cusp, facing that same uh, intracardiac echo area that we talked about before. And this was the location of that electrogram that you saw on the previous slide, and this was a successful location of that in a patient who was unsuccessful, I think two or two or three times at a, uh, another uh, institution. Now again, this is important. Uh, this uh, pointing down in this uh, will avoid uh, coronary artery injury. And uh, stereotaxis makes this able to do that just at stereotaxis catheter. This reported manually on how to do this, uh, first out of Japan. Uh, but what they report is using an agilis catheter with a very small curve to point back down. But 
that's a, that is a difficult thing to do with a manual catheter, uh, but stereotaxis makes this relatively easy. Uh, the worst case scenario uh, is what I consider PVCs and VT from this location in the, in the presence of an unwound aorta. And so the aorta, you know, winds at the, at the curvature and, and comes down at an angle. In people, particularly with long-standing hypertension, occasional valve disease, the aorta becomes unwound and, you know, traverses in just in a, uh, almost all the way across the chest and coming back down. That increases the distance between the left coronary cusp and the summit area significantly. And that's really the only one where with standard techniques like I've talked about, I've not been successful and had to resort to, to other techniques. And so we'll go into some of those other techniques if you do have to get deeper in this uh, location. So radiosurgery is uh, certainly uh, one of the possibilities, altering the, uh, uh, the saline concentration uh, in the catheter, bipolar ablation, and alcohol ablation in the coronary veins have been uh, reported. And so radio ablation, uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time, we actually have not done it for this location, specifically for the summit, we have done it for septal myopathy. And uh, septal myopathy can be very difficult to deal with. And so uh, using uh, stereotactic radio surgery, we have used for that and have seen uh, some uh, success in that. Uh, and certainly I would uh, uh, leave most of this uh, discussion to Dan and, and Dr. Uh, Kuzilich uh, uh, for this further, but basically you define the area and uh, deliver the radiotherapy to that area, keeping in mind of the, the surrounding structures. But really the key is you have to define the area for the radiation colleges. And so the, the mapping uh, of uh, the substrate mapping uh, uh, is really important to be able to relate to them where you need to do this type of ablation. Bipolar ablation is another one we've used and actually in the one, uh, one case of the unwound aorta that I was unable to get with standard techniques, bipolar actually did work. Uh, so standard ablation, we didn't consider unipolar, catheter to back patch, bipolar between two catheters. Uh, lesions are more linear, but they are deeper. Uh, altering the size of the returning electrode may actually increase the lesion size too. And there's been some data on simultaneous uh, unipolar uh, ablation potentially being similar. And this is just a, this was a software, a test software that we used uh, on both sides of a septum. So not the same location, but, uh, uh, but just, to, just to show you what that looks like. And then alcohol ablation, mostly reported in some uh, case reports in a few series. And then here you just see a, uh, a uh, basically a balloon put into the coronary vein and a branch of it. This is done after wire mapping. And then you inflate the balloon and, and inject denatured alcohol into that. Uh, into that vein uh, to potentially take care of that. Uh, not used much in this area, you got a lot of important structures there, uh, but some people have reported uh, doing it. And then uh, altering the saline concentration, half normal saline, uh, you may get uh, deeper lesions in there. We have personally not seen success in this location in altering the saline concentration, uh, but uh, in our series that we were uh, part of, uh, we did see uh, uh, in, in other locations, it did it, it seem to help. And so in conclusion, uh, you can certainly use your electrocardiogram for general localization of this area. Multi-site mapping and ablation may be necessary for successful ablation. And then you've got some options if you, if you do need more depth. Stereotaxis, as I said, is just integral to all of these and, and makes these cases go much easier and, much, uh, and certainly much faster. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, David. That was a great talk. Um, again, yeah, that's our usual approach. I'm, I'm sure all the centers pretty much approach the summit PVCs, you know, your ECG localization, and then you figure out its outflow. Uh, the magnetic navigation catheter, you know, what we do is we map the RVOT first, and it's very easy to maneuver this catheter into the coronary sinus. So invariably, we will have those maps created first before going into the aorta or transeptal. Uh, I'm sure everybody probably does the same, same way. Um, questions for you, David. Uh, how about transeptal approach to reach coronary cusps? Uh, so we, I have done that. It's uh, typically I only do that in the uh, 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 in the case of a significant aortic abnormality. 
it's still uh, in terms of contact force, in terms of the uh, uh, ease, uh, retrograde aortic is easier. Uh, but in those cases of where there's issues with an interrupted aorta or something like that, then absolutely uh, go transeptal into the uh, uh, into the aorta, then make a loop and bring it back down into the coronary cusps, uh, relatively similar to what you saw in the pulmonic cusp and how you do it and that you bring that loop down into it. And so certainly can be done, impossible to do with a manual. Uh, and so you know, we do use that technique. Can you has discuss that ablation? Published? Has that been published anywhere? I guess is one of the questions. Uh, I think it was, uh, it is mentioned in one of our papers. I'm try, I don't remember, it's not published as, a, as the main portion of it, but I believe in one of our papers it was mentioned in, uh, in the approach to, um, I think it's some congenital diseases. Can you discuss ablation power settings in the outflow area, David? Sure. Um, typically, uh, above the valves, uh, there's no particular science to this, uh, but I usually start at 30 watts uh, and then uh, certainly make sure my impedance is an appropriate number and then start at 30 watts. If I don't see any EKG change, then I'll quickly ramp up to 40, 45. Really the only reason that I do that is I don't shoot coronary angiograms in, in these people. And so the, the only time that I've, from this lo these locations that I've actually ever seen even transient uh, ST changes, uh, the, an anomalous uh, right coronary artery uh, off of the left cusp actually comes off very low and more into the cusp. And so the, uh, I did see inferior ST changes from a left coronary cusp, which you wouldn't expect. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't know that there was a, a, an anomalous coronary in that case. That's really the only reason I do that. But otherwise, very typically I'm doing uh, lesions uh, 45 seconds, starting at 30 watts, probably for five to seven seconds, and then going up to 40, 45. Okay. One thing, uh mention is that especially in non ischemics I will actually routinely map the coronary ostea with the RMT catheter. You know, it's soft, irrigated, you know, non-traumatic. And so you can avoid needing to do an angiogram uh, that way as well and know exactly where your coronary ostea are if you actually build them into your 3D uh, electroanatomic map, uh, which you can do with the mapping catheter. Yeah, I, I agree. The only, the only thing I'll add to that is um, the you know, anomalous coronaries obviously are very rare, so it doesn't come up a lot. But when, when the RCA comes off the left cusp, it's often, if it runs between the great vessels, it's slit-like. And even if you're shooting the coronaries and you don't know about it, you're unlikely to cannulate that, that RCA. You'll get the left man and you'll shoot and it'll be a false sense of safety. Um, so we love to get coronary CTs, you know, before these procedures and that, that eliminates um, that possibility and, and we don't typically shoot cores. We will at times kind of map out the proximal RCA in the left main um, uh, just to delineate the ostea. Uh, but and we'll shoot contrast through the catheter sometimes uh, to just confirm we're at the base of the cusp. But usually with ice you can get a really good sense of that. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. I know uh, people are asking for Questions and the panelists are answering in the chat section, so uh, take a look. But we'll move on to the second last to talk with uh, Pete Wise from Banner. He's going to talk about uh, integration of newer advanced mapping systems uh, with magnetic navigation. So, Pete, on to you. You see my screen okay? Yeah, we, we can see you. Yeah. Great, right, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to speak today about what might be considered EP 3.0, uh, looking toward the future, uh, as I uh, like to do. Uh, as many of us do, uh, and it's particularly speaking about uh, magnetic navigation and uh, some newer technologies with high definition, non-contact mapping and advanced ultrasound imaging, and whether or not these may finally give us the keys to moving forward with automation. Uh, and here are my disclosures. Uh, you know, why, why should we consider moving forward with automation in EP? Uh, you know, this comes from the manufacturing uh, literature, uh, but you know, the bottom line, of course, is as technology advances, human error becomes more and more visible every day. 
Uh, in human error, in, at least manufacturing, is thought to be responsible for more than 80% of failures and defects. And I think that we all feel uh, that that is likely uh, to be the case in medicine as well. Uh, you know, so of course, as the world moves forward, uh, we want to minimize uh, those errors if at all possible and use the uh, best of the tools that we can create uh, to help our patients. So really the question is, is it time to shift the paradigm? And you know, uh, we've spoken, of course, many times before about the fact that we've become very excellent technicians, but really a lot of this is to overcome limitations of existing technology. And that when we iterate the existing technologies, we often cannot fully overcome the inherent limitations of the current tools and human error. And then in virtually every industry, advances in hardware and software have superseded human manual abilities alone. Uh, and so I, I really do believe that uh, automation will need to be a bigger and bigger player over time as we build the next generation of what we're going to offer to our patients. You know, and, and uh, many of you have seen this before, but I just want to remind ourselves about what the standard is. Uh, of course, contact force uh, manual ablation. Uh, and if we go back to the original Takata studies, we, we and look at behind the scenes, we see just tremendously wide variation in contact force uh, between operators, within operators. Uh, and really points to the fact that even in the most experienced users, there's just a tremendous amount of variability uh, that's inherent in the current standard of care. And uh, you know, a really great recent study by uh, Tool Verma's group uh, where they blinded operators uh, to contact force numbers and not contact force numbers using the exact same catheters and technique uh, showed no difference in clinical outcomes uh, in a year, uh, in addition to showing no difference in actual lesion uh, parameters and, and that sort of thing as well. Again, really calling into question this fact that contact force has, has really significantly changed what we're doing for our patients other than making us feel better about knowing uh, a number. Uh, and of course, uh, this is mentioned by uh, uh, Jared Bunch as well uh, and, and some of the others, you know, this is not all benign. The stiffness of these catheters is significant. Uh, this is a group from China looking at over 10,000 patients uh, showing an over twofold increase uh, in cardiac tamponade uh, in atrial afib ablation uh, using contact force catheters versus not. Uh, you know, even the recent late breaker that just came out at HRS, uh, where they looked at the SDSF catheter in persistent AF, uh, was notable for 1.5% rate of tamponade. Uh, and yeah, it's a low percentage, but we do a lot of these procedures. And to think that you're going to have a tamponade uh, in one or two out of every 100 patients that you treat, uh, to me, actually, just is not great, you know, and, uh, you know, I, th I think that we all feel that we could be able to do better. Uh, and of course, this is really the, the reality of contact force uh, is that we have uh, an average that's being given to us as a number in the midst of a catheter that is stiff uh, and working in a flexible moving system. And the real numbers are bouncing back and forth with every breath, with every heartbeat. Uh, of course, the stiffness of the catheter is inherent to their construction. Uh, and we also of course, lack the consistency of contact, uh, which would account for the ability to make more optimal mapping and ablation, uh, as uh, Jared so eloquently discussed uh, as well. And so, yeah, you know, what can we do or should we be doing to move forward? Um, you know, first of all, uh, to improve the care of our patients, I think it breaks down into several major areas. We need to have improved safety and efficacy of our mapping and ablation catheters. We need to have predictable reproducible lesion formation. We need to be able to reduce risk, increase ease of use. We also need to have reliable and accurate navigation. We need to have accurate and efficient navigation within the chamber that we're working in. We need to have reliable representation of catheter position and tissue contact. We need to have outstanding integration with 3D mapping technologies, including real-time feedback uh, to eventually do our best. And finally, this is a piece that we have been missing all the way along as we talk about ablation and mapping. Uh, we have really lacked real-time ability to characterize our target tissues. Uh, you know, we can, of course, uh, bring in CTs and MRIs from the outside, but we really lack the ability to do this in real time for the most part. Uh, and this, of course, will inform important questions such as, you know, what lesions are needed for both safety and efficacy at each site according to that patient. Of course, we want enough for transmurality, uh, for durable PBI, uh, for instance, or successful ablation anywhere within the heart. But obviously, we want to also reduce damage to adjacent structures. Uh, and finally, we also want to successfully identify areas truly needing treatment. You know, do we have to wipe out the posterior wall in every patient? Do we need to isolate the appendage in every patient? 
you know, the likelihood, of course, is that the answer is no. We never have to do the same thing for every patient. We need to instead be more elegant in our ability to determine what each patient needs and then successfully uh, deliver that therapy. Uh, and finally, as the technology evolves, it's super important in my mind that these systems be as open platform as possible. Uh, and really the integration of these technologies is, is where we're going to be successful. And without being open platform, we won't be able to have uh, the continued parallel and synergistic into, uh, innovation that will be necessary uh, to move our technologies forward. So of course, we've heard uh, all this all morning about Taxis, and I will uh, just point out, of course, that we're moving towards a new generation here with the new Genesis system uh, that will be the platform for moving forward and hopefully provide additional flexibility and power uh, to this uh, system as far as magnetic navigation. Um, uh, and of course, this doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, we have more than 10 years of experience, 15 years at this point, some of us, uh, with more than 100,000 procedures completed and many, many publications supporting its use. Uh, again, randomized trials ongoing, uh, but there really is a preponderance of data supporting that this technology uh, has a significant potential for uh, success, and as it improves and becomes integrated with other technologies, can truly be a platform for the future now with a, a newer and FDA-approved uh, uh, hardware to go with it. Um, but uh, I also want to discuss the addition and the importance of integration with the mapping technology, and in particular, uh, a relatively unique uh, mapping system that I think has the potential to play a tremendous role going forward. Uh, and this is the acutest uh, mapping system. Some of you may be familiar, others not so much. Uh, for those not familiar, on the left is their mapping catheter, which uh, in addition to being just a beautiful uh, work of industrial art, uh, is uh, notable for having 48 ultrasound crystals, uh, as well as 48 non-contact dipole mapping sensors, uh, and integrated, of course, uh, with uh, their mapping system uh, in an open platform way that can be used with multiple ablation catheters, uh, integrate with multiple other imaging uh, modalities as well. And one of the unique aspects of this uh, is that the anatomy that's being created is actually created with ultrasound. So the chan chamber that's being worked on is scanned using the 48 omnidirectional ultrasound uh, transducers that are on the catheter that is within the chamber. Uh, this is able to create uh, maps uh, using up to 115,000 ultrasound points per minute, creating an undistur uh, undisturbed, undistorted uh, image of the chamber anatomy. Remember when we make our anatomies using manual catheters that have stiffness to them, we're actually often distorting the chamber, especially in the left atrium where we're pushing it out. This should give you uh, instead, with the ultrasound, real undistorted anatomy. The other thing is just the rapidity of it. Uh, it really just takes a couple of minutes here. Uh, you're actually seeing real-time anatomy. Uh, this is not sped up, actually, on the right here. Uh, that can be uh, recreated at any time throughout the procedure as well. So anatomically, we have some real uh, abilities here that are unique with the ultrasound. Then as far as electroanatomic mapping, uh, the system is capable of creating a uh, true high resolution mapping of every beat across the whole chamber uh, from a single position. And the way this works is that the uh, system has on its catheter tiny non-contact electrodes that measure the contribution of the distributed charge sources across the whole chamber at once. The system then calculates the equivalent unipolar electrogram at each of about 4,000 unique points on the chamber surface for every heartbeat. And due to the biophysics of this, uh, and in comparison with bipolar contact mapping allows for up to four times the resolution. Uh, we don't have the bipolar blindness that comes uh, along with bipolar contact mapping here. Uh, and then the system can display the local activation time of each electrogram as a moving isochronal map, uh, really showing us unaltered activation of even highly irregular arrhythmias such as AFib. Uh, and so, you know, there really is an opportunity here to visualize irregular arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation uh, that we have really not seen before, uh, where most of our systems that we use with contact mapping, even high definition contact mapping, where we have to stitch together various parts of the chamber uh, over time. Uh, and again, with some the limited uh, resolution of bipolar uh, mapping, uh, makes those much better uh, at addressing organized arrhythmias as opposed to disorganized arrhythmias, while this system is capable of mapping both in a very eloquent way. Um, and so with that background, 
uh, we've actually, and, and there's really just a few of us, uh, Tomas has, has done a bunch of combined cases as well, uh, but we've combined using this mapping system with Stereotaxis. Uh, it, at this point, treated a total of 19 patients. Uh, very much looking forward to getting to work again once we have our uh, new Stereotaxis system and doing this, especially now that the software is fully integrated. Uh, these were done more in parallel. Uh, but all these cases were done with the uh, acutus Acumap system only. No other mapping systems were brought into the cases. Uh, in addition, all done with Stereotaxis alone. No other ablation catheters used. Uh, the majority of patients were uh, patients with persistent AFib and often were redos up to a fourth time. Uh, most needed pulmonary vein isolation, uh, at least uh, if, if uh, a redo uh, touch up, uh, as well as treatment of non PV AF substrate. Uh, mapping and ablation of atypical flutters, uh, typical flutter in several, and uh, one patient actually turned out to have an internal as well, which uh, was treated. Uh, the workflow includes uh, creating the ultrasound anatomy, which you see here by uh, spinning the catheter within the chamber. Uh, important for doing a case with magnetic navigation is to bring the magnets before you make the anatomy so there's no distortion in the magnetic fields once you start mapping. Uh, and then after that, to create the dipole, dipole activation mapping. Uh, where we will map atrial fibrillation, atypical flutters, whatever the patient has come in with or whatever we induce. Uh, and importantly, and we'll discuss this a bit, but going forward, we're also looking at bringing some of the things we've learned from BT into atrial arrhythmias here, where we're gonna map sinus rhythm and use differential pacing to look for underlying substrate, zones of flow conduction, et cetera, within the atrium, that then will correlate to what we see with the arrhythmias. Uh, and so we collect all this mapping information. It's done just in a couple of minutes. Uh, it takes literally 30 seconds to map atrial fibrillation. It takes about one minute to map uh, any typical flutter or other organized arrhythmia. Uh, while those maps are being created, uh, we use the system to perform pulmonary vein antral isolation, uh, which has been quite uh, successful uh, and uh, can be evaluated either with a, um, a circular mapping catheter placed in the chamber uh, or potentially uh, with the uh, acutus system itself. Uh, and then beyond that, we, as I mentioned, are starting to look at substrate in addition. Uh, where we look at differential pacing, flow to analyze, which does seem to indicate some zones of flow conduction as bunched isochrones, often during uh, pace rhythms. Uh, and then we induce the tachyarrhythmia and evaluate a similar areas, also demonstrate slow conduction and repetitive behavior as possible essential components of the tachycardia, which allows us to have new regions to focus on for ablation. Um, you know, this is one example of a patient who came in with a typical flutter. And this is actually a sinus rhythm uh, map. And you can very clearly see, and we kind of cheated here by giving you a, a, a recognition spot here, we can really see that there's bunching of the isochrones and slowing of conduction in the zone between the mitral annulus and the left atrial appendage during sinus rhythm. And we looked at that same patient in their induced atrial flutter. We very clearly see this clockwise mitral annular flutter, but again, with clear bunching of isochrones and slowing of conduction through that same zone very nicely correlating uh, these two things together in a way that we often don't see uh, with traditional mapping technologies. Uh, of course, ablation was performed and terminated the tachycardia, and we did differential pacing from the appendage, uh, which showed approximately 115 milliseconds across the line and shorter conduction here initially. But when we looked at it and remapped with the acuity system, we actually showed that actually we actually have very late breakthrough through the line and that while we may have quit ablating in the past, we actually probably were not done. And we actually went back and did further ablation, showing instead finally that the electrical signal breaks out uh, likely through the ridge toward the other side and then back around where we finally do have complete block uh, along this line. So again, here the system helping us to do more than we may have done otherwise. Uh, and of course, we can see nice demonstration of activation post ablation to show that we have block uh, in our lines as well, uh, in this case during a uh, PBI plus uh, sort of ablation for AF. Uh, and now, you know, starting to look at persistent AFib, this is probably where things get the most exciting. Uh, this is a patient with persistent AFib, ablation hasn't been done yet. Uh, and this is actually pacing from the mid coronary sinus to 300 milliseconds in this patient where if you look on the anterior wall, we see again some bunching of isochrones and slow conduction here. And more interestingly, on the posterior wall, uh, we see the beginnings of what looks like figure of eight type reentry uh, into the zone of, again, slow conduction. And so 
again, this is the patient with persistent AF who'd been cardioverted and with differential pacing. And now when we look at that same patient in atrial fibrillation, we begin to identify areas where we see that on the anterior wall, again, some slow meandering of conduction through this area, what we call uh, localized irregular activity. Uh, similarly, and more obviously on the posterior wall, we see the same region involved here with the slow meandering of conduction, as well as some rotational activity. But as opposed to some other mapping technologies, it's not all about rotation, uh, but instead these repetitive patterns uh, about normal conduction here it can come from any direction. It can come in different ways. It can rotate, it can meander through. But again, these areas continue to light up as interesting areas and we're hard at work trying to figure out the importance of that. I do hope that targeting those areas might provide additional benefit to us in treating our patients. Um, so that's what we've been able to do so far, but we actually are now entering a new era with these technologies as well. Uh, from the magnetic navigation uh, perspective, uh, we are uh, hoping to be soon in random, I'm sorry, in the uh, IDE trials for approval for a new ablation catheter. Of course, uh, many of us uh, having a huge sigh of relief about this after a decade of using the same catheter. Uh, the new catheter uh, will uh, allow for both mapping and ablation, uh, including use of the e-contact module that uh, Tomas uh, had shown us, but at this point only available in Europe. Uh, it will have some unique parameters, including gold tip with round flow, also curve tip as well, which may reduce the importance of being uh, straight on versus tangential, et cetera. Um, also, the system has eight, um, this catheter has eight magnets in its shaft, as well as uh, over 100% uh, more magnetic material in its tip, uh, which uh, should allow for better navigation, uh, better ablation. I had the opportunity to drive this in the uh, simulator, uh, and it's incredibly flexible now as far as being able to make smooth curves without hinge points. Uh, and again, the tip being more powerful, uh, able to uh, have better uh, connection and better navigability. So we're looking forward to being able to use this. Then when we integrate and think about imaging that will need to go along with this, uh, the ultrasound imaging, again, from the acuity system carries with it a lot of promise. Uh, of course, I showed you the chamber being created, which was sort of our usual two-dimensional uh, uh, shell, uh, but the system is capable in its second and third order ultrasound uh, reflections of giving us information like real-time wall thickness, as well as potential for real-time catheter positioning and uh, contact information as well. So, you know, while not quite yet ready for prime time, this stuff is on its way and should be able to really inform us in ways we haven't before. Think for just a second about the fact that we've never performed AF ablation knowing the exact thickness of the tissue that we are ablating at that moment, okay? We don't know how big a lesion should deliver for safety and effectiveness yet, and we need to know that in real time to really move this forward. We also should be able to see, hopefully in real time, some of the secondary structures. Uh, here, early work, again, demonstrating building of the esophageal uh, ultrasound image from within the left atrium using the ultrasound capabilities uh, of the acutus catheter. Uh, and finally, in looking at tissue density, uh, et cetera, on ultrasound, we should hopefully be able to do a better job of understanding areas of fibrosis and then how we might be able to correlate that to what we're seeing with the functional uh, electrophysiology that we saw earlier. So what is next for our patients? You know, we have technology that allows for accurate and efficient navigation, technology that allows us to create predictable reproducible lesions. We have improved safety and effectiveness of catheter movement and ablation, especially with what we hope to be the new uh, ablation catheter coming out. I will mention importantly that uh, Stereotaxis is not the only company working on ablation catheters as well. Some others, including Acutis, are going to be working on new catheters too, and hopefully we'll have much more choice going forward uh, based upon that. But then you add to that the integration with 3D electroanatomic mapping technologies with real-time feedback and the characterization of the target tissues. Uh, again, where are we in real time? How thick is the tissue? What is the character of that tissue? Uh, will really allow us to do better for our patients. And importantly, finally, it seems that the key tools are truly coming together to bring automation to our patients, to be able to feed all this navigation and tissue characterization information into the navigation and ablation system and have them work in a feedback loop to really move towards automation and reduce the amount of human error involved. Uh, finally, I mentioned that we are late to the party. Now, it's true 
I think many of us argue the complexity of what we do is very high in comparison to, for instance, prostate surgery. But if you have prostate surgery in the U.S. right now, there's about a 90% market penetration of robotic surgery in that uh, arena. And certainly the growth continues to be uh, very strong. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, we should be part of that. Uh, and so why pursue automation in EP? We've talked about what we've been doing in the past, right? And the fact that virtually other, every other industry has advanced as far as its use of hardware and software in treating uh, its patients, including in medicine. And bottom line, it is now time, and I think now we will have the tools to truly move forward uh, to the next paradigm. So uh, I ask all of you to consider uh, joining us uh, as uh, robotic heroes uh, and uh, doing the best to treat our patients. Thank you so much. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Pete. That was a great talk. You know, I'm, I'm glad that newer companies and newer technologies are coming you know, for integration. So thanks for showing us the acutest medical uh, integration. Again, you know, we don't have experience with that yet, hopefully gets our hands on. Uh, question for you, Pete. Uh, somebody in the audience is asking, the map you showed during the persistent AF, where you showed the rotation, is this a face mapping or a map created with multiple time periods stitched together that showed the rotation? No, this is actually a continuous map of, uh, in that case, I believe 15, 20 seconds of AFib. So each of those beats, you know, every beat is being mapped the entire chamber all at once with over 4,000 points for each beat. And so what you're seeing is a continuous map. And if you see repetitive rotation, that's because it returns to that area and shows that same pattern over and over again. Uh, that's why you saw it look different for every beat that came through as well. Sometimes you had rotation, sometimes you had that sort of meandering, uh, slow conduction, et cetera. Um, and so it is not stitched together and it is not altered in any way, nor is the system pointing you and saying, this is what that is right there. It's actually just showing you, okay? And then, of course, it's up to you to interpret uh, at this point what you see. But it is pretty stunning how we are seeing some correlates between what we see during sinus rhythm and differential pacing mapping, uh, and then looking at these folks in their atrial fibrillation in particular, uh, and seeing these areas correlate with each other uh, as far as what might be called strange conduction, so to speak, or these areas of regular activity. And again, I'll, I'm not focused in this so much on rotation per se. Uh, we all know some of the uh, potential pitfalls there. Um, but instead, I think more importantly, that these sites light up as having this irregular activity that is repetitive uh, throughout, throughout longer segments of atrial fibrillation. And if you watch it for 30 seconds or a full minute, this can all be displayed uh, and you can see whether these same areas continue to draw your attention. And they asked, did you ablate in that area that looked like rotation? And did you map post ablation for that patient? Yes, we typically do. So we ablate those areas. Uh, in, we try not to create linear lesions unless we need to, although for very close, for instance, uh, that area in the posterior wall turned out to be very close to a WACA uh, uh, lesion uh, set that was made for the right inferior vein. So we did tie it to that. And then we do go back. And actually, the, the protocol for doing this is actually iterative. So we actually will take a patient who comes in in atrial fibrillation, uh, we'll map atrial fibrillation, then we'll cardiovert, map in sinus rhythm, map with pacing from the proximal and distal CS at different cycle lengths. Uh, then we'll go ahead and do uh, our vein isolation uh, and ablate the areas of interest that we're seeing. And then we'll actually reinduce AFib and remap uh, and see if those same areas look the same or look different, uh, identify other areas of interest, uh, potentially ablate other areas that show those patterns. Uh, and we, we look at the remaps both in terms of have we affected what we thought we were going to affect, have we actually created efficient lesions, and also have we changed the arrhythmia in some way that shows other areas of interest. Um, and then the protocol that we're following and, and should, will soon be part of a larger research study uh, will basically continue to iterate that until we see either non-inducibility of AFib or uh, no more areas of particular interest according to these patterns. So often we'll find more, you know, and the Uncover AFib study, which was published, uh, that was done on patients in Canada and Europe, uh, did show that the more of these areas that were ablated, the higher the success rate uh, comparatively uh, to those patients who had less areas identified of interest uh, in this way. Question, another, exp uh, any experience with acutus in the ventricles? Great question. Not in human beings as of yet. Uh, early animal experience, uh, experiments are underway, and uh, 
I think we all see that there's the potential for tremendous uh, interest there as well. So that that will be coming, but it is not currently uh, part of it. And of course, a lot of what you saw in my talk on, on both the uh, stir taxes and acute side is is not yet FDA approved or, or ready uh, for daily use. But uh, but is hard. Everybody's hard at work in, at bringing those things forward. Can I comment on steam pops in um, atrium or the ventricle using remote magnetic navigation? Do they happen and how to avoid them? Yeah, I, in my experience, they are much, much less frequent than they are uh, with the manual catheters, especially uh, the contact force uh, stiff catheters where you'll see uh, steam pops. Um, I think in boy, well over a thousand procedures, uh, I am aware of one single steam pop uh, ever in my experience with a magnetic catheter. So uh, it's not that it can't happen. Obviously, any catheter that gets stuck into a crevice and uh, ablated high energy, you could potentially have it. But because you're not, uh, you know, forcefully pushing into the tissue like Jared uh, had showed can be done with manual catheters and, and tenting the tissue and, and creating these craters, et cetera, um, it's, ex it's exceptionally rare with an RMT catheter in my experience. I'd, others can weigh in on that for sure as well. Similar experience, you never heard of steam pop. Again, you're sitting outside, you won't hear it, but uh, we haven't seen any tamponades or complications from blading with RM, RMT. Now, yeah, I, I agree with that. Hmm. I, I think you do have to be careful in the, the inframedial papillary muscle. You can find areas where you can get really lodged in and the impedance is high. And if you're delivering 40 to 50 watts, it's, it's still, still ablation. You can still cause a pop in that situation. And, and just just a, yeah. just a clarity uh, that that actually uh, the integration is FDA and FDA cleared and CEMAR. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly what I was to say. Late last year. Yeah, yeah. So the procedures that I did uh, were before that, so they were done in parallel. But now we have full integration uh, and FDA approval for that integration between acutus and stereotaxis now as a alternative uh, to the fully integrated Cardo system. Um, and I know that other users, of course, use. Uh, you know, magnetic navigation with the other mapping systems as well, uh, and have to be used in parallel, not in uh, in integrated form. But now we have, do have full integration as well. That's correct. I can't right. wait to use it. Same here. Yeah, perfect. All righty. I think we're going to end the session uh, here, Pete, and then we're going to move on Thanks. to uh, our last session, uh, talking about telemedicine and robotic navigation during pandemic. So off to Dr. Crystal and David Fischel. Um, um, I only have two slides to show. Can you move to the next slide? Yeah. So the, you know, uh, we wanted to bring up some points which came in discussions uh, two or three weeks ago. What's our particular uh, benefits potentially of the using robotic technology in EPLAB uh, in the present form? Um, uh, it's uh, clearly uh, may uh, have some resonance with uh, uh, infection prevention and control in the labs. And I think it uh, does it numerous ways. First of all, it reduces cross-exposure time uh, between patient and the operator um, uh, for both uh, uh, airborne uh, pathogens, but also for uh, bloodborne pathogens. And uh, we kind of became dismissive about it, but we all know that, uh, you know, no gloves and double double gloves are, are perfect with this respect. Uh, a reduction of minimum level of personnel needed in the room, that's clearly uh, uh, may be achieved uh, uh, since uh, at least the main operator uh, may uh, uh, go to the uh, control room. I think there's a role uh, in preservation of the sterile field by distancing the operator. Uh, we all know that you know the longer and closer we stand to the sterile field, uh, uh, the more chances it will be contamination. It's also uh, reducing amount of uh, human instrument manipulation, uh, which uh, frequently uh, happens in uh, manual procedures, in essence, uh, non-stop. And finally, uh, we frequently use second person to help us with uh, stability of um, ice imaging or repositioning additional catheter. And I think uh, using uh, tools which Unfortunately, we don't use widely nowadays as V-Drive or uh, ice catheter. Uh, and I would say particularly V-Drive with ice, which um, brings together automated imaging. Um, uh, also helpful to reduce the uh, need for additional uh, people in the room. Um, and can we do 
go to the next slide. Yeah, and so my other slide is simple. Like inside the lab, you reduce need for primary operator a continuous presence, uh, and you reduce a need for secondary operator uh, presence intermittently. In the control room, uh, and that's where telemedicine is coming, uh, it may help you to reduce need for specialist presence um, uh, using remote assistance, uh, which David will expand on. Um, it also reduces the need of physical uh, peer presence using remote assistance if you need uh, someone to uh, support you during the procedure. And finally, it also potentially reduces the amount of nurse or tech support because you actually uh, can independently control uh, all, um, uh, you know, all controls uh, through the single uh, screen interface. Um, so that's, uh, those are my points. And uh, I would probably ask David to um, uh, extend this presentation and then uh, go to the question. Thank you very much for including me. And it's, um, it's really beautiful to watch how SCRN has grown and developed into, into such a useful organization. So I want to just commend uh, everyone who, who was a part of this. It's really a, it's really a pleasure to see. Um, robotics is, um, is kind of a perfect uh, uh, kind of an, and perhaps necessary um, uh, base to allow for uh, telemedicine in, in the interventional setting. And we've always viewed telemedicine as one of these important characteristics to, uh, to the robotic system. It's particularly obviously important uh, given, given the realities of the last couple of months. And so I wanted to present just over the next uh, three slides um, a framework through which Stereotexas thinks about telerobotics, um, the benefits that we see currently with it, and the ways that we hope to advance it uh, in hand, hand in hand with you, because it really has to be a community and a joint effort uh, between us as the technology developers, but you really as the ones who pioneer the technology and use it and determine the best ways to use it in your practices. When we think about kind of telerobotics, I, I, I think about it in three, three categories and kind of along a framework, and that framework ranges from the most realistic and current right now to that that is kind of a, a still done now, but is kind of the most futuristic. The first is really telerobotic support, where a stereotaxis representative or another representative from industry is supporting a procedure, but they're doing so remotely. And this is, um, this kind of really is a complement to the established practice of in-person support in labs. Um, by allowing, we have now um, every stereotaxis sales uh, person uh, uh, across the US and Europe has the capability to support labs remotely. And there's probably over 70 labs uh, uh, globally that have the VPN connectivity and the connectivity technology to, uh, to be supported remotely. Um, and, and, and again, this is a complement to in-person support. So it allows us to, to support labs when with reduced risk of viral transmission in the labs, there's less individuals in the lab setting. And uh, we've heard more and more from some of you that hospitals are starting to, uh, to reduce kind of uh, the, place limitations on, uh, on industry coming to support procedures. And so we want to make sure that we can continue to make sure you have great clinical outcomes, you have great uh, technical uh, experiences with the system, and we can do that both in person and remotely. The other thing that it allows is you might be, let's say, able to have your, your typical mapping representative continue to join you without interruption, but oftentimes you want to have a more experienced representative who's, who's great at a particular aspect of the technology. And again, there might be limitations uh, in the coming months and, and perhaps longer on, uh, on those types of visits being allowed. This allows specialists to come in uh, without, again, increasing the risk in the hospital setting for transmission. This technology obviously does work. Uh, Stereotaxis has been using it daily uh, across, uh, across the world uh, over the last couple of months. Um, and, and I think that kind of increased use and feedback from, from you, from the physician community, can really help us as we try to improve the technology and evolve it. We are kind of embarking on, a, on multiple technological improvements to make the technology more accessible, more affordable, easier to install across any lab and make it more user friendly. And again, kind of your feedback in using it really can help us develop this. Another thing that I just want to make clear on this is that we have an open hand 
uh, to sharing this support capability with others in industry. And so let's say if you have mapping representatives that need to uh, support you and that allows you to treat patients better and allows you to have a better practice and there's difficulties in, lever in, in kind of having in-person support, we will openly kind of no cost, no questions asked, we share the technology, we'll set up the VPN connectivity, they can leverage our same connectivity technology and existing infrastructure that we have built and they'll be able to support you also remotely. And um, they'll be able to control and edit the mapping system without interfering with your control of the navigation screen. And again, it's just, um, that's the right thing to do. It, it, it allows you to have successful practices, it allows patients to be treated well. And, uh, and obviously in this environment, we're all trying to do everything the best way we can. If we step from a kind of industry providing support to physicians during procedures, there's kind of a second thing which is very similar, but that's peer-to-peer -peer support. And, and what you can imagine is the easier that we make, and this is obviously possible now, we're able to provide the same software solutions, connectivity solutions that our team has to support uh, hospitals and labs. We're able to also install that on, on your laptops or your work computers or your, your home computers. Um, but there's obviously ways that also over time we can make it easier to access, perhaps from anywhere with kind of in a more streamlined approach. And, and really the benefits that we see of kind of uh, enhancing peer-to-peer -peer support broadly is in a few buckets. First, it allows these collaborative networks to form where physicians can support each other in complex cases. And in the ideal setting, you have a, a group of you that enjoy working together and suddenly one of you is having difficulty in a case, it allows you to send a text message to the, to the other and, to, and for that other person to easily log in from wherever they are and to see what you're seeing and provide perhaps some guidance uh, during the procedure. We have seen some hospitals already where let's say an attending physician has the software installed in their office and, uh, and it allows them to provide greater training and oversight of fellows, let's say, who are, who are practicing in the operating room and to do it from their office setting. And so we've seen that starting to take place in terms of improved training. And, and then last, which I think is kind of particularly interesting, is we know that peer-to-peer -peer procedure observations are, are kind of a, in a really important part of allowing for this cross-pollination of learning, allowing for, for increased kind of um, a sharing of education across kind of a uh, the, across the community. And obviously with the travel restrictions that exist now, that is more and more difficult. Uh, we have been hosting many physicians to St. Louis, actually to our headquarters, on what we call telerobotic visits, telerobotic test drives. And we can enable that as well. So if you have an Odyssey screen, and if you have kind of the VPN connectivity available with us, we can again on a on one-off basis also allow you to host other physicians uh, virtually. They can see everything that you're doing during a procedure. They can see your ECGs, they can see your map, they can see your ice imaging, they can see obviously your navigation, um, and, and you can speak with them by phone at the same time. And that allows again for this continuous education between peers to take place despite the restrictive environment that unfortunately we all live in. And we'd obviously love to see more use of this and again, more experience because that in, can inform how we develop the technology and how we make sure it continues to improve. The last thing, and I know that this has always been kind of um, uh, perhaps the most exciting and most interesting uh, longer term goal is to enable also telerobotic procedures where a physician is, is seated in one location, a patient with the robotic system is, is my, you know, two miles away or, or a few thousand miles away and, and, and really allowing for uh, remote procedures. And this obviously has been done. Uh, Tama said, uh, uh, just a couple years ago at the SCRN conference in Miami was treating a patient back in, in Rotterdam. Uh, already 10, 15 years ago, uh, Professor Paponi at HRS treated a patient in Milan. And so this is obviously something that's possible. And, and over time, this is a technology that can increase access to high quality care in underserved communities and can really allow skilled electrophysiologists to leverage their, their uh, their capabilities beyond kind of the otherwise geographical limitations. This is kind of an area where technologically we know it can be done. And as connectivity technology has improved, uh, as, as lag in kind of internet connectivity has, has improved and really been reduced, there's no longer major setups required. 
with the existing connectivity that Stereotaxis has, the, the existing connectivity that most of you have in your labs with us already, we can enable these procedures to take place. The real challenge is actually the legal aspect. And I think about legal in a broader sense, right? How do you think about credentialing? How do you think about insurance? How do you think about uh, potential liability? Um, uh, these are kind of the questions that have to play out. And I think that kind of really, this is an area where SCRN and, and kind of the individual physicians here on this call can provide great leadership. Um, and there's probably multiple ways to do this. And I hope that maybe over the coming weeks, we might kind of set up a separate uh, session where we may perhaps talk about this in much greater detail and really brainstorm together. But, um, but I think kind of a first stage is in building a body of clinical literature. It'd be, it'd be interesting if someone had decided to do uh, 20 procedures, perhaps even just within their own site, from their office to the lab, um, and, uh, and published it. Um, it would be great if there were little pods, if there's a few physicians that know that they have the credentialing and that they can get the, uh, the institutional acceptance of, uh, of doing a study like this, perhaps there can be a little pod of users who do that. And so I think, again, kind of as we start to build the clinical literature, as we start to build the awareness here and develop regular use cases, this really takes this from being uh, still a novelty to a, to a real reality that can positively impact the world. I don't know if there's any questions or if... Uh... Hi, David. Um, as I have now a microphone, I can as well use it. I think that's great. I think it's a great outlook. I have an acronym for that, for that study that you just suggested. I think it should call, be called the BEACH trial. Because as, as David is showing us, we should all sit at the beach doing this and should not be called the office trial, but maybe from doing it from really remote, from a very pleasant position. Um, I think the key limitation, I think you've made it very well clear, I think it's a legal situation because I could easily see myself doing a case with someone that I know and I know the local team can handle whatever rare chance for complication is. Um, but of course, we need to see the patient. We cannot just do it. Um, you know, so if, that, if those teams could work together, having an expert um, joining, I think, is a great opportunity to, to collaborate. It's a great, great way of working together. And I think that, that in itself is already a great perspective. Doing completely independent procedures with people who, you know, you've never met the patient, you've never met the team, you would just go and do something. Um, sounds a bit outlandish to me at the moment, at least. But sure. Maybe that's something that we should you know, aim for. I don't know. I, I agree. In everything, you want to crawl before you walk and then walk before you run. And so I think kind of that's where either there might be two institutions that have the type of relationship and have the the, the legal mechanisms are in place where that's not very difficult. But again, even interest study, right? Uh, uh, Sabine, if, if, uh, if you had a, a publication where you are uh, from your uh, office, you are treating the patient who is three stories below you, right? And again, you know, obviously, your entire staff. You have an attending physician who's in the lab uh, doing the procedure. That would be a very, very interesting publication, I would think. And again, the distance of, of 100 meters, perhaps, between your office and the lab, uh, that's, that's, uh, there's not a big difference between being 100 meters away and being 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away. Uh, I agree. The, yeah. oh, go ahead, Sabine. I just say, you know, the proof of concept would be relatively easily done, of course. Yeah. You could do it with a fellow in the room and you could sit in your office. That's probably feasible. Yeah, and I have two thoughts. You know, of course, the current situation has normalized the idea of telemedicine in a way that we never really uh, had before, both as far as just how we feel about it, as well as the legal and even uh, reimbursement framework around it, right? And that provides a potential window here to, to potentially move somewhat from, uh, you know, what we're doing in the clinic, which uh, telemedicine has now obviously become much more ingrained to, to potentially more in the way of pro uh, procedural medicine. Um, I'll, of course, I'll also mention that if we are able to introduce more automation and reduction of human error in these procedures, uh, then some of those issues that are so concerning with not being there with the patient would also be reduced uh, as well. It would really level the playing field uh, and, and markedly you know, reduce the 
uh, impact of uh, different physician capabilities, uh, in a sense, between areas, and allow us to share our intellectual help uh, with each other and not have to worry so much about the technical aspect. Perfect. Yeah. I, I see a few questions. Um, would you like me to answer them? Yeah, go uh, ahead, David. You can answer those. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Del Orfano um, asked that uh, what is currently needed to control stereotypes from my office to my lab with an EP in the room. Um, uh, I don't know exactly your lab, Dr. Del Orfano, but if you have uh, an Odyssey screen and, and if we have the VPN connectivity established, uh, we would just need to work with you to make sure that. Um, that the that the right software is installed on your office computer, and then it would um, then it would work. There would really not not be a need for. I mean, you would need to install our software, but uh, but there wouldn't be a need for you to do anything, um, kind of otherwise uh, from an IT perspective. Um, and then um, there's also a question: on How's the internet connection reliability being ensured for telerobotics? And you're right, that is a that is a challenge, right? It, nothing is. It is all dependent on the internet connectivity being there. And that's why, let's say, 15 years ago, and probably or 13 years ago, whenever it was the, the first procedure that was a telerobotic procedure, in order to complete it, there had to be a buildup that I, I understood costed tens of thousands of dollars in terms of the internet lines being built up. Well, let's say when we were at SCRN in Miami uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we used uh, the normal internet. And so again, it seems like given the improvements in internet connectivity generally, um, that has become a lower and lower concern, a lower and lower risk, and we're already we're getting to the stage where where that doesn't anymore really impact um, uh, kind of uh, things on a regular basis. Beautiful. Thank you, David, for answering those. Of course, you need to make sure that this is secure and it cannot be hijacked. I think you would not find a patient who would be happy to put their life, if it's so, um, on the table for not being sure that the patient, <laughs> that the physician who was supposed to treat him is actually treating him. So I think there's a, there's a fear for robotics to be not human driven in, in these kind of procedures. So it's a, it's a human assisted procedure. Com completely right. Um, First of all, on both points, first of all, none of robotics is just a tool, right? None of these procedures are actually performed robotically. They're performed by a human who's using a tool to enhance what the human is already capable of. So that's, that's one. And second of all, obviously, uh, things like cybersecurity, things like pri patient privacy are very important. And uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, that is why we have established a solution that, um, you know, again, uh, my assumption is that everything can be hacked. If, the, if the governments and secure governments can be hacked, I'm sure it's possible with enough uh, malicious intent. Uh, but overall, um, our, our IT connectivity solution has been reviewed through IT due diligences at, at uh, uh, you know, uh, almost 100 hospitals and, uh, and including very, very sophisticated IT teams. And that's why we develop it in a way where it can work. And we kind of uh, reviewed in that rigor and still work well. Um, and then the, the thing on patient privacy, right now, uh, still, if you have the patient's name on the screen, then it is visible remotely. And so uh, there might be, there might have to be protocols for, for, say, at the hospital where you use an identifier rather than the patient name on the, on the screen. Or, um, or there might be ways where stereotaxis over time can introduce kind of automated de identification. That's again. That's the first. That's, that's where learning how you best use the system, where you see the difficulties, that allows us to kind of also learn about how best to evolve the technology. Again, uh, more information. I want everybody to uh, log into scrn-a.com for further information about our society, what we do, upcoming events, and a lot of publications. scrn.eu for the European website. Um, again, I would like to thank everybody who uh, helped us in putting this together and especially I want to thank uh, personally uh, Petra and Marlos uh, who helped me in uh, organizing this this meeting and thank you very much uh, and thank you everybody who, who joined and I would like to discuss uh, that we will hopefully with the pandemic you know simmering down hopefully we all can join in person in live in Miami in November where we have our uh, fifth annual global SCR meeting 
which Dr. Peter Weiss is uh, chairing and uh, spearheading. I hope uh, to see everybody there uh, in a few months. The platform is open. If somebody has to add, uh, add any comments, please go ahead. Uh, no, Gurjeet, uh, thank you so much for putting this together. Really a spectacular event uh, and uh, very nimble to figure out how to navigate around all of our challenges. Uh, and again, thanks again to our sponsors, uh, and specifically Stair Taxes and Acutus for uh, helping provide, provide funding uh, for this. Uh, and again, I uh, look forward to seeing everybody in Miami or having a uh, hopefully imaginative virtual meeting, if not uh, at the time. So please pencil in those dates, either in person or virtually. Thank you. Yes, November 11th and 12th. Yeah. I think with this, we will conclude our webinar. Thank you again, everybody, and have a happy and safe uh, Mother's Day.